Welcome to an Alt Shift X live stream to discuss House of the Dragon episode 9. We're going to talk all about the episode, we're going to answer your questions, we are not going to spoil future episodes, and there's going to be a shorter explained video coming later in the week. Folks, this episode was balls to the wall bonkers. This episode was wild. This episode did a lot of crazy stuff that is not in the books. They really went off the script on this one. And I I think I liked it. It was crazy. They had like this whole ch game, this whole like this this whole like thriller movie of trying to grab King Aegon and get control of the king, the the most important piece in the chess game was was Aegon. And Aegon had no interest in being king. He was literally running. This this young man was sprinting away from the throne and they had to drag him to it kicking and screaming. And and yet, I thought it was so beautiful that you know Aegon on the way to his coronation he had no interest in the politics, but he was just saying, man, I really wish one of my parents loved me. I really wish someone loved me. And then at his coronation, when he saw the thousands of people shouting his name, he bathed in the adoration because in the first time in his life, he, he actually felt loved. And I think this is such a great arc for Aegon as a villain because it shows how, it shows how he becomes invested in being king. It's not for any of the politics, it's just because of his deep need to be loved. And we also learn that he's a monster who, like, participates in child pit fights, but we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get to that. We also had this bananas moment with Rhaenys Targaryen bursting up through the floor of the dragon pit on her dragon Melis during Aegon's coronation, facing the Greens faction, looking as though for a moment she was about to burn and and kill all of the Greens, but chose not to. She took the moral high ground and she left, which is which which was not in the books. It, it's something that probably would have made the history books. Uh, you know, the fact that there was a there was a dragon at the coronation. Um, so this is a bit of a deviation from the books, but I thought that was interesting. It's really Rainey's sending a message to Alison saying like, hey, we need to choose peace. Like, we as women are not going to allow the men to drag us into bloody war. We need to take the moral high ground and we need to prevent war. Because that's sort of what happened in that conversation between Rhaenys and Alicent, where Rhaenys told Alicent, hey, like, are you going to let your father start a war over this? Are you going to get Rhaenyra and her children murdered? Or are you going to take control of the situation and do this in a more moral, respectable way? I thought it was such a cool choice how Alicent... Alicent wants Aegon to be king. So she comes to small council saying, yeah, Aegon's going to be king. But she's horrified to see that everyone else at the small council, Otto and the Iron Rod and Tyland, they have been plotting to do this coup for years without telling her. And while Alicent has like this deep emotional reason to support Aegon, that she wants to honor the memory of her husband, King Viserys, the, the men were gonna do it anyway. They don't give a shit about her deep emotional reason for supporting Aegon. They're doing it for, for their own political ambitions. So Alicent and Otto both have the same goal of wanting to put Aegon on the throne, but they have completely different motivations and they have a different moral approach because Alicent does not want to kill Rhaenyra and her family, but Otto considers that a necessity. And as evil as it is that Otto was saying we should murder Rhaenyra and her children, he, he might be right. He might be right. You know, a few must die for the good of the realm. Incidentally, how many people did Rhaenys and Melis kill when she burst up through the dragon pit? She, like, Rhaenys, like, Rhaenys may be taking the moral high ground here, but she just killed, like... I mean, probably, like, hundreds of these random innocent common people when she burst up through the floor, didn't she? It's funny how, like, even the more moral characters, like Rainies, are still slaughtering random peasants for no reason all day and all night. 
Um, so yeah, that was wild. Mazaria is like a social activist. I was not expecting that. Um, Mazaria took control of Aegon and like hid him in the church. Uh, and then Mazaria was saying to Otto like, hey, maybe we should not allow child uh, slave pit fights in this city. Like, Mazaria, I think, is someone who has suffered slavery and has suffered exploitation, and she wants to protect others, which which is not something that's in the books, but, you know, it, it makes sense, I suppose, that Mazaria, you know, wants to protect others from the thing that happened to her. Um, but, yeah, that was a really interesting change, and I thought it was hilarious that Aegon was found literally locked into, like, the central plinth in the sept in the city, which is absurd, but I, I kind of love it. The irony of this, like, drunk, wasted prince in this holy place. Uh, and uh, B's in the chat. B's in the chat. Because Lord Lyman Beesbury is dead. Uh, Lord Lyman was uh, kind of losing his marbles, kind of doddery, didn't really seem in control of what was going on. Um, but it was Lord Lyman Beesbury. He alone, well, not he alone, but it was it was Lyman Beesbury who stu stood up and said, hey, maybe we should not steal the throne from Rhaenyra, because Viserys always said that, you know, Rhaenyra was, his, was who he wanted on the throne. And then Criston killed Lyman Beesbury, sort of impaled him on his council ball. Can you impale someone on a ball? Because Criston just did. Um... So that that was dark. In in the books, Mushroom claims that Kristen threw Beesbury out a window. Uh, and I think it's Eustace who says that he just slits his throat, but here in Hot D, he, uh, he balls him right in the noggin. So yeah, Bees in the chat. And also, like, uh, you know, against... Like, like while Mazaria was taking the king and doing her whole um, cat and mouse game, uh, Lionel Strong approached Alicent and was informing Alicent about, like, the spy network that Mazaria has. And we come to the charming revelation that uh, Laris Strong is a foot fetishist. And, it, and, and he's feeding Alicent information in return for some glimpses of her queenly feet for him to masturbate to. Which, which w you'll be shocked to hear is not in the books. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, it kind of makes sense um, in a funny way. Like, Laris has a deformed club foot, and so he fetishizes beautiful female feet. And I guess I guess this is what he's getting out of it. Like, people were speculating that, ooh, Laris is, is trying to start war for his political advancement, and he's secretly a green seer, and he's secretly playing both sides. Maybe he just likes feet. Or, or maybe D, all of the above. But, um, yeah, feet in the chat, folks. Feet in the chat. Okay, we will uh, answer your questions. Uh, let's see what you guys are talking about. Um, this was a crazy episode. Let's talk about it. Thank you for the super chat from Feebot, who says, I haven't watched the episode yet, but I'm as excited for your live streams. Oh, thanks, Feebot. Uh, Flawless says, Viserys pleading... Oh, those f are from a week ago. I'm sorry I didn't get to those earlier. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Catherine, who says, Why does Sir Crusty Hole, Kristen Cole, get to pop off and murder people, and no one bats an eye? Like, no one even looked scared after Harold backed off. Uh, yeah, well, the reason why Kristen can justify killing Lyman is that Lyman was a traitor, and traitors must die a traitor's death. Um... And everyone knows that Kristen sort of has Alicent's support. I mean, this, this this is war now, you know? This is war. People are being murdered. And if you don't side with Aegon on Team Green, you die. That is the message that is being sent there. It, it, it was sort of weird the way Kristen, like, like just shoved Beesbury's head to the table. Like, I think that maybe Kristen did not intend to kill Lyman Beesbury. It was just sort of an accident that the ball was there and it entered his 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 buzzy little brain and all his honey leaked out. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it is pretty wild. I mean, Kristen Cole has a long history of doing crazy violent stuff and getting away with it. So, that, so that's nothing new. But I thought that it was a really cool addition that, you know, it created this tension with Harold Westerling. And Harold Westerling 
left the greens and just and 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 no one even tried to stop him because I, I guess he's just too badass and too respected to be stopped which is a whole lot like uh barristan selmy in season one of game of thrones um when barristan says like hey like i i mean it's sort of a different situation because barristan gets um kicked out of the king's guard but in season one, episode eight, he 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 leaves and storms out and and goes and joins his preferred candidate Daenerys Targaryen when Joffrey dismisses Barristan, um, and he has a very sort of badass exit. So I thought it was a similar situation with um, Harold Westerling in this episode. Um, thank you for the super chat from Arthur, who says, "Can you watch the show with my grandparents to explain what's going on?" Um, Thanks for the super chat from Ishmael. Bit of foot fetish representation. I just wish we got some more Keltigar representation. Uh, Liam asks about Fever Dream. George wrote a vampire novel. Liz says switching t- sides to Team White Worm. I mean, I hope that the White Worm Mazaria is alive because because Allison said okay, like Laris, like if. Uh, Mazaria is running this rival spy network in the Red Keep. I-, I mean, she was saying that Mazaria was working with Otto, like feeding information to Otto, but, you know, she clearly has her own things going on as well, and she has this sort of social activist agenda, I suppose. Um, but then Alicent agreed for Laris to go and kill Mazaria. So then later we saw one of Laris's fireflies burning down a house that I suppose Mazaria was in. Um, so Mazaria might be dead now? Question mark, question mark. I hope she's okay. And I continue to wonder what Mazaria's relationship to Daemon might be. Because last time we saw Mazaria and Daemon together, you know, it was sort of, it was sort of weird. It was sort of a bit, um, it's not as friendly as it used to be. And so I wonder if they might reconnect, but, you know, Mazaria's working with the Greens and against Laris. And so there's a very sort of complicated web of allegiances going on here. Um, John says that Rhaenys not burning everybody was right from a writing standpoint. She's not a ruthless kinslayer. Yeah. Yeah, I I mean, it would be pretty wild for Rhaenys to just murder all the Greens here. But she's trying to... she's, She's trying to prevent a massive bloody war, is what she's trying to do. Uh, Brimstone says Melis declared war. Rainies could have ended it with one Dracarys. Curious scene they wrote. Yeah, it's a really interesting choice with Rainies. Um I, I think I see it really as a message to Alicent. It's like, I could have killed you and I didn't because I believe we can be better than this. Like that's what she was telling Alicent in in the room. And I thought it was so interesting how that led to Alicent opposing Otto. Like for the first time in the series, we finally got to see Alicent standing up to Otto and Alicent saying, like, I realize now that you have been manipulating me. You you have treated me as a pawn in a chess game all my life, and I'm not going to accept that anymore. And, you know, it's it's so interesting that Alicent is being framed as like, like Alicent's main motivation here is to prevent her father Otto from going and killing Rhaenyra. Like, that's Alicent's main concern this episode. Which is so interesting because, you know, she's framed as this villain and and as the leader of the Greens, but she's not really the one escalating the conflict, you know? Um, Lucky says that Rainey's not killing the Greens, yeah. And Shane says, Rainey's hit them with the I'm gonna get my dragon. I I enjoyed how Rainey's just sort of slinked off. She slunk off. Uh, during the dragon pit situation so that she could burst up with her dragon. Are there no, like, locked doors in between the dragon pit and the dragons like that? I wonder if the dragon keepers were down there. I would have liked it if, like, when Rainies went off, maybe Rainies could have, like, met with some of the dragon keepers down there and the dragon keepers might have, like, helped Rainies get Melis. Because the dragon keepers, I think, are sort of their own thing. The dragon keepers are, like, this weird little Valyrian-speaking, Valyrian culty sort of their own group. And I would have liked to have seen the dragon keepers aid Rainies. Because Rainies would have a relationship with the dragon keepers because she keeps a dragon at the dragon pit. So, um, so yeah, I thought that was interesting. Um, and seeing all of the common people getting herded into the, herded into the dragon pit. And of course, you know, we've seen the dragon pit before in Game of Thrones when it's a ruin many years later. Like in season seven, they have that big meeting at the dragon pit. It's like the 
biggest open place in King's Landing where you can get everyone together, so it's the logical place to do the coronation. And I like how they, you know, used all of the obvious symbols of kingly legitimacy to legitimize Aegon. This is the first time that we've seen uh, the iron, well, the Valyrian steel and ruby crown of Aegon the Conqueror. And Aegon also uses the sword, Blackfire, the Valyrian steel sword of Aegon. And he has the dagger, the cat's paw dagger that was Aegon's, and he's got the name of Aegon. So when you've got all of those symbols of legitimacy, then of course you must be the real king. How could anyone think otherwise? In the books, it was Kristen Cole who placed the crown on his head, and then Aegon flew a few times around the city riding his dragon Sunfire in the books. Um, but we've barely glimpsed Sunfire in the show so far. Uh, I also enjoyed Amon's role here, because Amon made it very clear a bunch of times that Amon wants the throne for himself. He considers himself more qualified than Aegon is. And, you know, we're sort of grappling with him and, and tussling, and it's this whole sort of sibling rivalry, and Amon has this whole, you know, I am more worthy of the crown because while you were partying, I studied the blade, and I studied history, and I should be the king. Um... And Aegon would rather like for Aemon to take the throne instead of him. Aegon says, like, hey, like, I'll run away. I'm not qualified. I don't want to be king. Let me go. But he was dragged kicking and screaming to the throne. And so that, that creates a really interesting dynamic with Aemon, who wants the throne more than he does. And there's all the stuff with, like, Arik and Eric, the twins, the Kingsguard twins. Um, and Eric left Team Green because he has like more of a moral compass than his identical brother Arik and so Arik is with the Greens while Eric left and went to join Rhaenyra uh, there's, there's a lot going on Alan Caswell AC like Alan Caswell was one of those loyal lords to Rhaenyra and like he was the one who greeted her outside the Red Keep last episode and looked like he was going to be an ally for Rhaenyra and so he tried to sneak off and alert Rhaenyra to her crown being stolen but Alan Caswell got hanged and caught and killed so he's another casualty this episode uh, Musa says that those balls turned out to be a workplace hazard. I, I really enjoyed how uh, they were sort of toying with the balls, you could say, um, when like they turned up at the small council meeting and Thailand like rolled his council ball um, and to, to clock in um, and Otto was sort of uh, was sort of holding his ball. He was sort of playing with his ball while he was let, let's be mature guys he was playing with his ball and then they they roll yeah here we are he sort of rolls the ball from iron rod to thailand it's a fun prop and i'm glad they're having fun with it i'm still waiting for a shot where like a ball rolls through a puddle of blood like i was i was expecting when beesbury was bleeding onto the table i i thought that they would show like blood on the ball or something that might have been cool Thanks for the super chat from Dish, who says, Does Alicent pay Laris with special viewings of her feet? Yes, I think that is what's going on. I mean, uh, you know, I, I think that Laris is interested in more than just feet pics. Like, I think that he absolutely has, like, a political angle as well. Like, he made himself Lord, you know, killing Harwin and Lionel. And, you know, I, I, I think that... He's in. He's into it for more than just feet, but yeah, that is clearly part of the appeal for him. We always did see this sort of like creepy staring uh, attraction that Laris has for Alicent, and uh, I suppose that um, I suppose we find that it really is at least partly a sexual thing for him. I, I really got the sense that Alicent is just so icked out and so tired with all of the horniness of all the men around her. Like, she is surrounded by men who are causing problems with their, with their libido. Like, she's got her son Aegon going around raping servants and creating all this horrible trouble and, um, you know, the child fights and stuff. And, you know, so, so her, her son's crazy horniness is a problem. He was masturbating out windows previously. Um, and, like, Viserys's attraction to Alicent in the first place is, like, how they got together and Alicent got dragged into this in the first place. Kristen has this sort of, I think, romantic love for Alicent. Like, it's not a 
totally sexual one. It's more of an abstract, knightly, courtly love. But I think Kristen has his attraction to Alicent. Um, and th th there's just all this, like, male sexual energy and male pride and ego that I think is driving so much of this conflict. And I think Alicent is super icked out by it and super conscious of it in this moment. And, and you know, I've said before that I think that the whole House of the Dragon story, like, it, it's all about sex being made politically significant like it is it is sex with stakes that, that is what a medieval political drama is sex with stakes because whoever has sex whoever who, like who hooks up with who determines the political future of the kingdom because it is a monarchy where where blood and and, and, a throne, and the throne is inherited and I, and i think that's what creates the drama in this show uh yeah thanks val we've sort of talked about rainy so i think she's taking the moral high ground um, Max says, I think the Rhaenys scene is foreshadowing common folk hating the dragons. Yeah, well, we're not going to spoil anything, but yeah, I, I think that, you know, the common people are maybe not going to be huge fans of dragons, given that Melis just, like, rampaged through the city and probably killed a bunch of people. Um, and, and that has always been one of the themes. I mean, not even just with dragons specifically. The line that Jorah says about, you know, when the High Lords play their Game of Thrones, it's the common people who suffer most. And, you know, I, I, you know, I, I really like throughout this whole ceremony how, you know, there was so much dignity and, and sort of holiness. They had the sept and the oils and everything seemed so, like, official and proper. Um from the point of view of the people watching this ceremony but like we know that so much dirty cheating lying shit happened to lead up to this moment with the people hanged and and the beesbury killed and the, and the prince dragged out blind drunk from under an altar like that's all of the dirty political lying underbelly that led to this like immaculate political ceremony and so it, it gives us a wonderful view of like the falseness of historical political narratives you know like that's part of the theme of the book is that the the political the political world presents itself as being clean and immaculate and divine right and noble princes but the reality is always so much more dirty um so yeah i really enjoyed that that view that we got of like the seedy underbelly of flea bottom um, and this thing with, like, the children fighting each other, like, fucking Pokemon, is uh, is inspired by the description in the books. In the books, it says that they found Aegon here, watching children with filed, sharp teeth fighting each other for entertainment. Um, it also says that a very young girl was giving uh, oral sex to Aegon. Uh, that's how it's described in the books. And so, uh, and it, and, you know, it, I, I think it's really cool how they also, like, subtly told us, oh, and by the way, Aegon has bastard children here. Like, Aegon has not only participated in this, like, evil, immoral pit of iniquity, Aegon has apparently hooked up with women here, sex workers, slaves, whatever the situation is, and Aegon has, has had bastard children, um, which also is based on the books. But, like, yeah, there are now confirmed bastard children of King Aegon II in Flea Bottom, which could be politically significant, you know? Like, any rival claimant to the throne is, is potentially a danger, so, like, that kid and any other kids could be important. Um, one of many, I'd wager, says Arik, or Eric. So yeah, I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed seeing all of that. And there was this girl, Jane. Um, there was this there was this woman who was, like, at the Flea Bottom place who is apparently working with Mazaria, and she led um, Arik and Eric and Otto to talk to... Yeah, here she is. This girl, Jane. At first, seeing this girl, I thought she might be Nettles. Not going to spoil anything, but that is... That, that there is a character later on who I thought that might be. But apparently, according to the subtitles, this is a woman called Jane... And I guess she's just someone who works with um, Mazaria. Thanks for the super chat from Wealth Wolf, who says, I came to this series expecting Magor with teats. Who would have thought that we'd see Alicent's feats? Thank you, Wealth Wolf. Sebastian says, I hope the Queen's feet become a main character. Um, bonk. 
Thank you, Monk, who says Laris support <laughs> Laris throwing his support behind House Togarian and Alice and Thigh Tower. Bonk, footing the bill. Okay. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Jaden, who says Rainies was badass. You know what my favorite bit was the armor. Like one of my complaints with the later seasons of Game of Thrones is that we never got to see Daenerys in armor when she was like flying around in battle riding her dragons. Like there was a moment in season seven where they said like, hey Daenerys, like it's really dangerous that you're just flying around in battle without any armor, like an arrow could hit you and kill you. And Daenerys is like, yeah, that's fine. Um, of course, a, a Targaryen monarch on a dragon rider would wear some badass armor. Like look at her bloody sleeveless vest here. Like, can you imagine the, the wind chill? Flying around, flying around in that outfit. Um, that was always disappointing. So I glad, I'm glad they've rectified that with some badass armor, you know? And this shows us that, you know, Rhaenys is a doer. Rhaenys is someone who, like, kicks ass and gets shit done. So uh, she's going to be a useful asset as the story continues. She did put that armor on really quick, didn't she? Thanks for the super chat from B Dink, who says, I'm glad they're making Alicent and Amond seem more gray now. Yeah, um, I, I think that what they're doing with Alicent is interesting. Like, in the books, it seems like Alicent is... In the books, Alicent does not seem this conflicted. Alicent seems just genuinely, de genuinely determined to get her son Aegon on the throne and screw over Rhaenyra. Like, um, like Alicent says, you know... Uh, supposedly, allegedly, Alicent says in the book, uh, maybe that whore Rhaenyra will die in childbirth. <laughs> so Alicent is not sympathetic to Rhaenyra at this point, at least as it's described in the books. But, you know, I, I think that given the closeness that we saw between Alicent and Rhaenyra last episode, it, it makes sense that, you know, Alicent's, Alicent has remembered her, her love for her friend as children, and, you know, while she does want her child on the throne, she does not want war, she does not want to murder Rhaenyra. So, you know, and, and so, yeah, I, I thought the tension between Alicent and Otto was so interesting, because, because, you know, it is important, it is important, not just who is on the throne, but how they get that person on the throne, you know? Like, if they can get Aegon onto the throne bloodlessly, then maybe it would be okay. I mean, it's like Rhaenys says to Alicent, like, hey, you know, we can, like Alicent says, we do not rule, but we may guide the men who do. And it's like, yeah, I mean, sure, Aegon is useless, but if they guide Aegon, or if they just rule on Aegon's behalf and just do the moral thing and look after the realm, then maybe it will be okay. Like, it's not necessarily all that important who whose bum is on the throne. It's more important what decisions are being made by the government behind that person. So I think Alicent makes sort of a, a good argument here that, you know, they could put Aegon on the throne and everything could be okay as long as they don't start a giant goddamn war. So... You know, I still think it, it kind of beggars belief that Alicent thinks that Viserys told her that Aegon is king. Um, because, you know, at the end of last episode, all Viserys said was like, Oh, the prince that was promised, Aegon's dream, you must do this, you are the one. Like, it, it's kind of a stretch that Alicent really believes that that means that Viserys wants Aegon to be king. I think that's very much like motivated reasoning from Alicent. And, and that is another big weird change from the books. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the super chat from Dread, who... Feet emoji. Thank you, Beesman, who says, Whatever my daughter is paying, I will double it. You have... Okay, a lot of feet comments. Thank you, Samuel, who says, Showrunner said it was Rhaenys's moral standing that stopped her from torching the high towers. It was a cool moment, and you needed to justify season two. I, I look. I, a lot of people take issue with Rainey's not murdering all of the high towers, but you've got to like keep in mind that that Rainey's does not know the future. Rainey's does not know what's going to happen next. Uh, uh, all, for for all Rainey's knows, for all we know, maybe Rhaenyra and Alicent will make peace. Um, th there's a lot of different ways this could go down, and in hindsight, things might seem obvious. But I, I don't think it's crazy that Rainey's didn't murder. All of the Greens right there. I did think it was crazy that the Greens didn't immediately run away when they were faced with a giant fire-breathing dragon, but there you go. And, and you know, incidentally, this is our first glimpse of Rhaenys' dragon, Melis, the Red Queen. 
Um, so it's exciting to see her as well. If we want to do a little quick dragon accounting, these are the dragons with riders who exist currently. Aegon, Aemond, Helena have dragons on the green side. And Rhaenyra, Daemon, Rhaenys, Jace, Luke, and Baela have dragons on the black side. Um, Jace, Luke, and Baela's dragons are quite small, young dragons. They're not quite as powerful. Like, the most powerful, the most powerful, the biggest and most powerful dragon right now is Vagar, ridden by Aemond. And then uh, Caraxes is probably the second most powerful dragon, or maybe Melis as well. Uh, and Cyrax is relatively young, but also pretty powerful. So it's probably like Vega, Caraxes, Melis, Dreamfire are like the most powerful. And then like Vermax, Arix, Moondancer are the least powerful. Moondancer is very young. I don't. I, can Moondancer even bear Baylor's weight right now? Moondancer is very young, so maybe not super relevant. But there are also lots of other dragons that are around. Like there's Vermithor and Silverwing, uh, which are big old dragons, and they are either in the Dragon Pit or on Dragonstone. And then you've got like Sea Smoke, who was Lenor's dragon. He's around, and then you've got more dragons that we'll learn about later. So oh, these dragons are obviously going to become more and more important as the story goes on. There's lots of dragons around. Thanks for the super chat from Flair, who says, Love the vids. Glad to see Cole using a sword instead of a flail. You kept calling it a morning star. Yeah, I know there's like terminology around the weapons. I, I just use whatever words the books use. I just use the terminology that George Martin uses in the books. And in the books, they call Kristen Cole's weapon a morning star. Um, so, you know, I just follow the book's lead. Uh, but yeah, George definitely uses some different terminology. Like, George calls, like, standard normal length swords long swords. That's what he calls just just these normal ass swords that everyone has. Um, whereas long swords in, like, real history apparently are long. Thus the name. But yeah, whatever. Terminology. Thanks for the super chat from Flavor, who says, Was Otto wanting to meet Aegon outside the city walls? He wanted to send Aegon away and install Aemond on the throne. I, I don't think Otto wanted to reject Aegon and make Aemond king, no. Um, I think that it was more about getting Aegon out of the city for, like, safety or, like, getting him away from Alicent's control. That was a bit weird, yeah. Um, but I, I don't think that Otto wants to, like, get rid of Aegon. I, I think that in a similar way to Alicent saying that, you know, we can just rule through Aegon, I think that Otto also expects to continue to be in charge um, of the realm as Hand of the King, if not Regent. Like, I think Otto intends to have... Con I, I think Otto thinks he can control Aegon. I, I thought that Otto had such a great line where he said that, you know... What we are doing is is for the interests of our family, you know, for the good of the family is what Otto said, which just rang so false because of how messed up their family is. And speaking of their family, I, I like that we got to get a glimpse of uh, Helena with her children. Um, Helena is the sister and wife of Aegon. And yeah, here it is. Um, Helena was just chilling and doing some some crocheting. And these are Helena and Aegon's two children, who are called Jehera and Jeheris. Um, and Jeheris, in the books, incidentally, has uh, six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. Uh, so, you know, I'm sure we'll we'll see more of it. But Jeheris and Jehera are um, a little bit unusual in various ways. And I also liked the serving woman who was, like, hanging out with Helena... And Helena was sort of uh, philosophizing about how, you know, everyone likes to take things from each other and, you know, jealousy is human nature. And then the serving woman was just like, yes, princess. Yes, of course. Yes. Um, I imagine that whoever works with Helena has to be saying an awful lot of smiling and nodding. You know what I mean? Helena says some unusual things and her servants <laughs> would hear some unusual things. And I love that Helena was knitting like a spider. And Helena said, again, there is a beast beneath the boards. And, like, the spider is, like, the symbol of Mazaria because people were talking about Mazaria as a spider with a web of informants. So I think that Helena, you know, consciously or not, is expressing her fear of the spies and the agents who are using the secret tunnels. And, you know, that she she's afraid of 
everything that's going on at the Red Keep, and uh, the spider is a reflection of that. I thought it was funny that Laris talked about bees this episode. A lot of people thought that uh, Laris's firefly symbol was a bee, because on, on his staff he's got this... Uh, this this bug that, you know, some people thought that was a bee, but apparently, according to the creators, it's actually a, a firefly. So it's kind of funny and confusing that, you know, we've got a lot of, like, mixed insect metaphors going on with bees and fireflies and spiders, or insects and arachnids. It's a, it's a whole goddamn menagerie here at the Red Cape. Thanks for the super chat from Charlie, who says, Melly, smash or pass. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Lee, who says the white worm can't be gone that fast. Do you think Mazari is dead? Do you think she burned in that house fire? We will have to find out. What if she gets burned by it? What if she walks out of the fire and becomes more angry and dangerous than before? I love how Laris's like signature move is arson. Like that's just his thing. He just he just loves a spot of arson. Um, whenever there's a mysterious, suspicious fire. We will know who to blame, I think. Thanks for the super chat from John, who says, What was the building that was on fire? Yeah, so Laris said, Hey, if you want me to murder Mazaria, I'll murder Mazaria. And Allison's like, Yeah, cool. Um, and so Laris burned the building where... I think this is the same building where we saw Talia visit Mazaria previously. So Laris was trying to kill Mazaria with this fire. And Mazaria is this woman who is the spy master who controls a lot of the spies in the Red Keep. And she used to be Daemon's lover. And now she's not. And she fed information to Otto. But she also has, like, this agenda trying to protect children. And yeah, Mazaria, Lady Misery, the White Worm. She goes by many names. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Haley, who says, Laris was my favorite character until this episode. Still a banger episode, probably my favorite. Fack says, the omission of Lord Beesbury's defenestration was highly disappointing. I was hoping to see Lord Beesbury get thrown out the window, which is what Mushroom says happened. Uh, Evan says, Laris went from creepy to really weird. Intriguing to creepy to really weird. Yeah, we, we haven't had very many scenes with Laris, but every scene we learn something crazy about him. Like, the first time we saw him, he's just like, ah, oh, he's just like this unassuming guy with a deformed foot who likes eating cookies and listening to chit-chat. Cool. What what a what a innocuous dude. And, and then in episode five, he just turns up and says, oh, by the way, I know about the secret abortion tea. I know about the plan B and I have strong opinions about flowers and all. And he, he like started the conflict between Rhaenyra and Alicent. Like, let's not forget, Laris, by telling Alicent about the moon tea, kind of kicked off some of the some of the big dangerous conflagrations that, that, to, that came. And um, so he's very much like the spark that started this fire in so many ways um and then yeah in episode six he he murdered his father and brother and uh seemed really chuffed about it in episode seven i, I like the increasing amounts of bling that we've seen on laris and on several others laris had like a bunch of like fancy jewelry look at this he, he, like, every episode, he's got fancier jewellery. And it's similar with, like, Tyland Lannister. Like, I thought, like, Tyland Lannister, the the master of coin and the brother of Jason Lannister, when we first met Tyland, he seemed like the more sort of, like, earnest, hard-working, good-natured brother. Like, Jason Lannister was always a douchebag. He was the one who hit on Rhaenyra, and he was really arrogant and unpleasant. Whereas Tyland, like, was just sort of this... He was sort of flustered and hardworking and doing his best. He didn't have any bling. He was just, like, working with the Stepstones and doing his best. But I, I feel like as the story has gone on, Tyland, now that he has more power and more privilege, he has become a bit more arrogant. Well, I think Tyland has you know, in a subtle way, become a worse dude as the story has gone on. I think power has corrupted Thailand to some extent. And the gradual blingification as he gets fancier jewellery with his power and with his wealth, um, I think speaks to how people are profiting from politics. 
Um, and that's how we end up with these like corrupt, messed up situations. Like there are men who have a lot to gain by siding with one side or the other, like Vaymond when he tried to make that alliance with the High Towers. Um, I enjoyed the scene where all of those lords were forced to kneel for the um, for the new king Aegon, and it was this moment of like, are you going to kneel and profit from siding with us, or are you going to die? And so Alan Caswell made the choice of, well, all right, I will kneel. I will, I will pretend to join the side of Aegon, even though I swore to support Rhaenyra. Because, you know, let's not forget that in episode one, um, King Viserys declared that Rhaenyra was his heir on the throne. And all of these lords swore to support Rhaenyra. Um, so all the lords who were there, who now support Aegon, are Oathbreakers. But a point that Thailand makes in the in Hot D and in the show is that a lot of the lords and ladies who were here are dead now. That was like 30 years ago or something. I mean, the timeline is different in the show, I suppose. Um, it was a long time ago when this happened. And so people, you know, some of these lords are dead and their children have inherited the lordships and the politics has shifted. So people are not all staying loyal. Uh, Chanel says that Sir Incelot got away with murder again. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think we can expect an increasing amounts of murder as the story goes on, if we're being honest. Dick says, why is there a more vocal reaction to Laris's preferences than Craster ever got? We are living in the strangest timeline. I don't think people... I mean, Craster was that guy in Game of Thrones um, who had a... Uh, evil, horrible, incestuous, uh, sex slave harem beyond the wall. Um, I, I, I don't think anyone thinks that Laris is worse than that. Thanks for the super chat from Jax, who says, I really enjoyed the camera work. They really do know how to get good footage. Yeah, there were some interesting shots going on. Throughout the series, there's been some interesting shots. I liked in the previous episode when the camera like swept over the Iron Throne down to show Otto on the throne. There are some really interesting camera work going on. AHS says, do you think Mazaria is going to strike back after getting her estate burned by Alicent? And will that give Otto the reins to control Aegon instead of her? I think that Mazaria... Mazaria was already kind of opposed to Laris as, like, rival merchants of information, I think. Like, Mazar... I think what's interesting is that Mazaria has this, like, trying to protect the people angle, which is not an angle that Laris has. So I think, yeah, they are fundamentally got different motivations, I suppose. Um, and will that give Otto the reins to control Aegon? Yeah, well, that was what happened. Blake says, there's an element of Rhaenys doing the opposite of what she was being forced to do. Rhaenys is defiant. Rhaenys is a rebel. Rhaenys said last episode that she wanted to stand alone. I, I think that in a way she was saying that, like, I'm, I'm better than this conflict you guys are doing. And, like, if I can walk away from this conflict, then you guys should walk away from this conflict too. I, I like how this was the, um, like, with all the trappings of political legitimacy that they were trying to summon, this chair in the background of the coronation scene is the same chair that we saw at the Harrenhal Council in Season 1, Episode 1. Uh, this chair that Jaehaerys is sitting on. I think it's the same one. You see that design? Same chair. Oh, or is it slightly different? Yeah, well, very similar chair anyway. Gabriella says, Rainey's definitely did that to ensure that if the Greens win, she can get some sort of pardon. I don't know if that's a, a good defense in court. Your Honor, I could have murdered you, but didn't. Ido says, was the beast, beast beneath the boards Rainey's and her dragon? That is uh, a cool interpretation because, yeah, like Melis, on Ra Melis and Rainey's were a beast that literally burst up from from beneath the floorboards at the dragon pit. So yeah, th that's a great point. I, I think in a way, Melis could be seen as a fulfillment of that prophecy. Um, but I don't think the beast beneath the boards thing has ended yet. Thanks for the super chat from Flavor. We answered that one. Thanks for the super chat from Oz, who says, yeah, the feral child fighting ring. We've all seen it. 
It was interesting how they specified that, like, with these children who were forced to fight each other for entertainment, they mentioned that, like, the gold cloaks or the city guards accept bribes in order to allow this stuff to continue. So it's a reminder of political corruption. I mean, I guess, you know, this is a time of prosperity. This is a time when there's a lot of money around in in the city and in the dynasty. And so I guess with all of that money lying around, that's an opportunity for corruption and bad things to go on. I mean, it sort of fits with the theme of decadence. The showrunners talked a lot about decadence in this time. And so we see all the big feasts and balls and dances and elaborate costumes and showing off all of this wealth. But there's also a kind of decadence, like an evil decadence in these like pits of depravity of like drinking and sex and slavery and gambling and fighting and all of those traditional uh, sins that are going on that's like another angle to the to the decadence and the indulgence that's going on both at the highest of the city and at the lowest and the lowest is where Aegon liked to enjoy himself and yeah Aegon is such a monster like Aegon not only raped Diana last episode but Aegon is is participating in these like child fights on the regular apparently and you know what happens to the children like, the bastard children that Aegon leaves here in the fighting pits, what happens to these kids? Do they get... Is Aegon allowing his bastard children to be made into child slave pit fighters with filed teeth? Is that what's, is that what's gonna happen to this bastard child of the king? I, w- I wonder if Mazaria might take control of this child in the same way that Mazaria took control of Aegon. Lots of crazy possibilities. Thanks for the super chat from Matthew, who says the queen who never was is so gangster. Nick says that Rhaenys didn't crisp the blacks because they're family and kinslaying is serious. And she's followed the law. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, that's another good point. Like, th- these families are all intermarried, the Valarions and Targaryens. So she's not going to, like, murder her own family. That would be a wild escalation and a sin that she would be hated for forever. Thanks for the super chat from Gunnar, who says, loving the performance of Helena. Yeah, I love how Helena is, like, simultaneously really sort of, like, naive and seems to, like, not know what's happening sometimes. But in other ways, in other ways, she's, like, the most insightful person in the room. Um, And seeing the tragedy of her, like, you know warning of the beast beneath the boards and the spider that she's drawing um and and she's so innocent of all of the bullshit that's gone down wasn't her choice to be married to Aegon but now she is the queen of the seven kingdoms Helena is the queen now and I wonder if she might embrace some kind of political power that would be cool maybe she's actually gonna I mean she's the bug queen now She's the entomologist queen. Maybe she's going to uh, look after the bugs of King's Landing. That would be fun too. Uh, yeah, she was not having a great time at the coronation, no. Um, like, I, I don't, like, you know, I mean, one of the ironies of this show is that everyone is fighting tooth and nail to take control of the throne and to be in charge of government. But being in the government, at least, you know, for the king and queen especially, it does not make their lives better. Like, and Aegon knows this. Like, Aegon knows that being king is not going to make his life better. It's going to put him in more danger and more stress and more responsibility that he doesn't want. It's really the people around the king and queen, the people who, the puppet masters who control these figureheads, like Otto, like, they are the people who really benefit. You know, the lords and the suck-ups and the brown noses, those are the people who benefit from putting someone on the throne. Um, And... Yeah, it's no fun. It's no fun. So I feel sorry for Helena, especially. Furman says, what were the intentions of Otto versus Alicent? I think the fundamental difference between Otto and Alicent in this episode was that Otto and Tyland and Jasper were willing to escalate this conflict, and they wanted to capture and kill Rhaenyra and her children, because as long as Rhaenyra and her children are alive, they are a potential threat to Aegon, King Aegon II, um, whereas Alicent did not want to kill Rhaenyra, and she was hoping to give Rhaenyra peace terms that Rhaenyra would agree to. Alicent was trying to find a more peaceful resolution to this conflict, whereas Otto was basically saying that, no, like, like 
violence is inevitable, so let's strike fast. Um, that's the main difference between Otto and Alison. So they were both trying to take control of the king, because when you have the king, uh, you've, you've got the power and you can set the terms. So that was that was the disagreement. And this is such a big deal for, for Alicent, because she has spent her whole life following um, her father's wishes, and now she finally stands up against him, which is a big deal. Thanks for the super chat from Tsuka, who says, did anything new show up in the opening? Yeah, the opening sequence was updated radically. Um, I haven't had time to, like, properly look through it. But yeah, they did change it. So here's like Jaehaerys and Alysanne. Um And in the background, we can see the Valerions. And there is Viserys. And then we go down to the star. Is that Alicent? Is Alicent... Has Alicent now got a seven-pointed star as her sigil? It used to just be a Hightower sigil, but now Alicent has her own sigil. The Faith of the Seven that she was wearing on her necklace. And then we've got, yeah, all right, we've got, we got four bloodlines. So in the in the books, um, Alicent and Viserys have four children. They have Aegon, Helena, Aemond, and a boy called Daeron. And the show's creators have said that there will be, uh, Daeron will turn up in season two. So I, I think that represents Dayron. Um And Dayron, I think, currently is is being fostered at Old Town, because that, that's what happens in the books. So there is another child who we're going to meet later on. Uh, then these other three. So I suppose this is Aegon and Helena and Amond. these three sigils. That bright blue sigil is interesting. Um, super, super minor, 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 mild spoiler, but... There was a moment in the preview trailer for the next episode that showed Amon taking his eye patch off, and I wonder if that bright blue thing represents a sapphire under Amon's eye, um, because the books mentioned that. Am I remembering that correctly? I think the books mentioned that Amon wears a sapphire in his empty eye socket under his eye patch. As if Amond needed to be more of a <laughs> an anime villain uh, bad guy. So I, I think that might be what that blue represents. Um, this symbol for Helena, it looks like a female figure on like a round thing. It, it looks like a woman like tied to a boulder or something crazy. I, 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 I mean, representing how Helena is like trapped or something. That is dark and weird. Um, and the Aegon sigil, I'm not sure what that one represents. Maybe it's meant to be Aegon's crown or Blackfire or something like that. Um, let's continue through the opening sequence. I suppose those are, yeah, those must be Jaehaerys and Jaehaera, um, the children of Aegon and Helena. There's actually three children of Aegon and Helena. Uh, w this episode we saw Jaehaerys and Jaehaera. But there's also a younger son called Melor, so I suppose that's what these three are. And see how Jaehaerys and Jaehaera are represented by hands? And I and I just said that, that Jaehaerys and Jaehaera uh, have, or Jaehaerys at least, has six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. Uh, so Laris would love Jaehaerys, I guess. Um, so yeah, I guess these are the three children of Helena and Aegon. Uh, and then further down... Is this going to be Rhaenyra's bloodline with Harwin? Who are these two? Are these Baylor and Rhaena? I thought Baylor and Rhaena were dragon eggs previously. Who were those two meant to be? Where are, or are they? Or is that like Jace and Luke? Yeah, I'll, I'll have to have a proper look at the opening sequence later. Anyway, um... Yeah, I, I, I've said before, I don't think the opening sequence is very helpful for figuring out the family tree. If you want to know the family tree, just 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 ask your old buddy Alt Shift X. Here's a here's a family tree where you can actually see what's going on. These are the children. So yeah, like Aegon and Helena have a have a third child, Maylor, at this point in the books. And Viserys and Alicent have a fourth child called Daeron at this point in the books. But these are the characters that we've actually seen on the show 
so far. Uh, and, you know, for the record, like, you know, Aegon, the, the newly crowned King Aegon II, is referred to as the Elder to distinguish him from Aegon, the other Aegon, the son of Rhaenyra and Daemon, who's a baby, and he's called the Younger. So we've got Aegon the Elder and Aegon the Younger. And we've also got, you know, baby Viserys, who I suppose is Viserys the Younger. Lots of reused names, just to keep it confusing. There was a scene in the previous episode that had uh, Rhaenys, Rhaena, and Rhaenyra all in the same scene, which, which seemed like a, like a joke to have so many characters with similar names all in the same sequence. Um, anyway, thanks for the super chat from Cal, who says, I hope Lainor gets word and comes back to fight. You know he loves a good war. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Like, like the only things that Lainor really showed interest in uh, were, like, partying with his boyfriends and war. Like, he's a really lovely guy, but when you look at his actual hobbies, he, um, his hobbies are, you know, war and partying. Um, and yeah, he was, like, whooping and hollering and, you know, enjoying the, the pod racing element of, of riding sea smoke on the stepstones. So maybe if they just, like, send, send Lainor a, a raven, maybe Lainor would row right the hell back and help out with any potential conflict that may come. I, I want to know what's going on with Sea Smoke. Because, again, like, it, it is a change from the books that Lainor is alive. Because in the show, in the books, Lainor seems to be really dead. And so that does leave this loose thread of, like, what's going on with Sea Smoke. Can Sea Smoke bond with a new writer while Lainor is still alive? Really interesting. Really interesting questions with Sea Smoke. Um, Stone says that Melis looked kind of cartoonish and the sound design wasn't great. I thought the sound of Melis was good, but yeah, the CGI has not always been amazing. Co Black says, It's interesting that there's not a lot of judgment of Rainey's killing innocent poor people with her dragon. Uh, could be seen as a worse impact than Aegon's acts. A reminder that no one is 100% good or bad in Game of Thrones. Yeah, I mean, it's a good reminder that even, like, the quote-unquote good guys and the bad guys in this story, they're all feudal warlords, basically. Like, everyone in this story... Um, is a politician who holds power through the threat of violence, which, you know, is maybe true of all politicians, hashtag topical, but, like, I think that, yeah, I mean, Rainey's, Rainey's murked a bunch of innocent poor people in this moment, and she, she, she probably should have gone out the back way. <laughs> she, 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 th there's multiple exits from the dragon pit, and she chose to go through the floor that innocent peasants were standing on. So, you know, and again, like with Jorah, like when the High Lords play their Game of Thrones, it's it's the innocent people who suffered. But like to, you know, Alicent and Rhaenys' credit, in this conversation, um, you know, they were saying, hey, like we have to, yeah, look at this. Alicent says, we must guide them gently away from violence and destruction and instead towards peace. And they talked about, like, the, the interests of the common people. So a, a, a true queen counts the cost to her people. So if you're looking for a moral defender of the common people, you should be supporting Alicent. Because Alicent is, I, I think in this show, the one person who has been most consistently speaking for protecting the common people and doing good for the realm. And I think sometimes that has been bullshit. I think sometimes Alicent's virtue has been a cloak of righteousness, quote-unquote. But Alicent has repeatedly said, hey, let's protect the people. So to her credit, you know, she is the one saying that. Um, she hasn't murdered people. She isn't trying to start a war. So I think she's cool. Thanks for the super chat from Sir Akimadud, who says, What exactly drove apart Arik and Eric? Yeah, it wasn't super clear in the episode, like, what the rift between Arik and Eric was. It wasn't super clear what went down there. But in the inside the episode after show, the, the creators were saying that, like, basically that Eric had more of a moral compass and Eric was, like, not a fan of the child pit fights, whereas Eric is like, eh, I'm just following orders, I'll stick with Aegon. So so that's why Eric and Eric went separate ways. Um, and Eric stayed to, like, fight Kristen for control of Aegon, which was all kind of confusing because Kristen was trying to bring Aegon to Alicent and Eric was trying to bring Aegon to Otto. It, it was sort of a weird, I, you know, I... I it's a weird thing that wasn't in the books. It's sort of a weird, like, internal power struggle. But um, but the point 
is that Arik and Eric have, have split up and Eric has gone to Rhaenyra. And Harold Westerling has gone to Rhaenyra, presumably, uh, when he left the Greens. Um, or maybe he hasn't, I don't know. But yeah, the, the Kingsguard has become politicized, which is, like, not great. It's, I mean, it's a little bit like when the Supreme Court gets pl- politicized. Like, they are meant to be unbiased and apolitical, but they have power, so inevitably they do become politicized and they do become divided. So it becomes a a problem when this, you know, supposedly impartial institution becomes itself another battleground. Thanks for the super chat from Kion, who says, I wonder if Princess Rhaenys Targaryen's skill in dragon riding can outperform Aemon Targaryen due to having much more experience by decades. Yeah, I think that's a great point, because there is, like, a generational difference here. Like, Aemon is young. Aemon is meant to be, like, 19 years old in the book at this point. Um, and, yeah, Aemon has the most powerful dragon in the world, but, like, can Aemon even control? Like, can Aemon handle that much dragon? Rhaenys is a goddamn veteran, like, 50-something-year-old woman who, who, you know, dragon riding has been her passion for decades, and it takes time to develop that bond, you know? Um, so I think that Rhaenys' control of Melis should be, like, sublime. Like, she should really know what she's doing. Um, but I think also, you know, like, th- there is sort of an implication, I think, um, at least in the show and sometimes in the books, that, that dragons do have a sort of their own personality, and there's sometimes maybe a psychic connection between the dragon and their rider. So I feel like Vagar herself could um, be in control. Like, like Vagar is the most experienced warrior in this world because Vagar is the oldest dragon in this world, and um, I think that Vagar could more than handle herself. I think Amond could just come along for the ride. You know, I think Amond's expertise may not even be relevant compared to the sheer power and experience of Vagar. Um, like, if Rhaenys is, like, the old sort of, like, powerful badass grandma of the humans, Vagar is the old powerful grandma of the dragons. So, yeah, there's a lot of goddamn power and history in some of these oldies compared to these, um, young upstarts. And I, and I think that, you know, something that the previous episode got across really well is that the older the, the older people, the adults, like, they are more mature, they have experienced loss, they have experienced pain, and so they are more reluctant to start a war, with the, with the notable exception of Otto. Um, whereas the young kids, like Amond and Jace and Luke, they are full of spunk and bluster, and they are super willing to start fisticuffs at the drop of a hat. So th- I think some of the worst violence may come from the kids, Whereas the adults, who may be more powerful, are a bit more restrained, usually. I want to see more from Baylor and Reyna as well. Like, I think that next episode we're going to see, you know, Rhaenyra's perspective. Because this whole episode took place from the Greens' perspective, with Alicent and Otto and and, and Kristen and and Aegon and Aemon. Whereas next episode, I think, will be from the perspective of Rhaenyra and Daemon and Jace and Luke um, and Reyna. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens on the next episode. Thanks for the super chat from Doser Doc, who says, What happened to Sea Smoke, the dragon of Lenor? We don't know. Can Lenor bond with someone new? We don't know. Carl says, Is Helena's depiction in the show faithful to the books so far? Seems like a cool character. Helena is different in the show compared to the books. In the books, Helena gets like almost no description at all. They just say in the books that, oh, Helena is, like, less hot than other Targaryens, Uh, but she's plump and happy and will be a good mother. That's, that's like, the extent of the description of Helena in the books. So I think that in the show they they made a really good choice by giving Helena this sort of insight um, and this awareness that sort of she can say these cryptic revealing things to us as the audience... And they give her all this, like, subtle ca- characterization that doesn't, like, dramatically impact the plot itself. So, like, th- there's nothing about Helena's character that contradicts the books, but it definitely adds a lot more layers and depth to Helena as a character. Like, they added the bug 
interest. They added the sort of neurodivergent aspect. They added the cryptic sayings. So I think that, like so many other characters in this show, that the show has done a really good job of taking what's in the book and adding to it without, like, totally contradicting it. Uh, thank you, Wealth Wolf. We are not going to spoil anything in the future, but um, yeah, I would certainly keep an eye on that bastard child of Aegon who we saw in the uh, child fighting pits, which is not a phrase I was expecting to use. Thanks for the super chat from Buster Destroyer, who says, Speaking of all the male sexuality icking Alicent out, Otto made that comment about her looking like her mother felt manipulative and odd yes i completely agree buster and i meant i meant to say that yeah because like that 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 angle of like alicent seeming grossed out by all the horny men around her i i think in a way that includes her father yeah because like her father made this weird comment about how alicent looks like her mother um and it just felt a bit icky like remember when otto told alicent to put on her mother's dress in order to go and seduce the king like, there's an ickiness to it. And that just inherently comes from, like, the intimacy and the sexuality of this royal family. Like, who boned who is of national security importance. So, like, all of these family members have huge political investment in their, like, family's sex lives. And that just creates this ickiness, this incestuous intimacy between everybody all the time. And it's just fucking g gross. <laughs> Ko says, no Amon's B kids will be recruited to fight and ride dragons. Not sure what you're saying, but, like, th there is the issue of, like, who can ride dragons. Like, I mean, that that's going to be something that's discussed next episode, is, like, who has the weapons of war right now. And, you know, we, we discussed the dragon accounting before. Like, these are the dragons who currently have riders, but there are other dragons who don't have riders. And every Targaryen-blooded person who doesn't have a dragon is a potential dragon rider. Will Joffrey Valarion, son of Rhaenyra, get a dragon? Will Rhaena finally get a dragon? Will baby Jahera and Jaehaerys get dragons and ride them with their with their 12 toes and 12 fingers. Um, the dragon riding aspect is important. Dasson says, Why do the showrunners write Alicent to act like she has no agency, especially with Laris? Even as a grown woman, she doesn't have any drive of her own. I, I think that the point of some of these scenes was about Alicent seizing her agency. Like, Alicent was saying to Otto, like, Hey, you have like, manipulated me. You have treated me as a pawn my whole life. You have used me, and I'm not going to accept that anymore. So I'm going to seize Aegon for myself, and I'm going to do things my way, and I'm going to take the throne, but not start a war. So I think this was about Alicent seizing her um, agency. But, I mean, that's definitely, like, a, a complex theme throughout Alicent's arc, right? Because, you know, like, like she has always felt... Like, she doesn't have freedom. She has always felt trapped in the expectations of court and in the expectations of her father and in the expectations of her husband. And there's a lot of moments where it's like, Alison is not comfortable with the position that she's in, but she feels like she has to go along with it. Um, but, you know, we can compare that to Rhaenyra because Rhaenyra, like, in theory, is under a lot of the same pressures and expectations. But while Alicent obeys, Rhaenyra often rebels. So it's like, you know, Alicent, you could say, is going along with pressures that maybe she could have resisted more. Like, you know, right, Alicent now is finally rebelling against Otto, but it's like maybe she should have done that sooner. And I think that as Alicent grows up, instead of, like, rejecting the powers that control her, she instead embraced them and used them as a tool. Like, the whole, like you know, a woman's courtesy is her armor and using the faith and the religion and using like the uh, moral religious laws and, and rules of this world, she has weaponized them. And when she finally stands up and asserts her power, it's not with a sword, it's not with a dragon, it's it's with a dress. So, so she is always like embraced and weaponized that like traditional feminine power within the patriarchal system. Um... And I think that we see that most visibly when she intimidates Diana. 
the serving girl who was raped by Aegon. And Alicent is, like, sympathetic, but at the same time, she's also, like, reinforcing and participating in this fucked up patriarchal system. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm probably not... I'm not the most qualified person to uh, expound on it, but I, I think that all the ideas around Alicent's agency and within the system that she exists, I, I think is definitely a complex theme for her arc. Thanks for the super chat from Eugenio, who says, Aegon is just a supportive dad cheering for his children during their sports activity in the after-school program of the Flea Bottom education system. <laughs> Eugenio, I... Y- oh, y- y- you're not wrong. Like, Aegon is just a soccer mom, you know? Like, I bet Aegon is coming and bringing some orange slices and snacks for his bastard children, you know, giving them a Gatorade after they... after their... (laughs) after their fight club. Um, Yeah, Aegon, I'm sure, has the best of intentions with his bastard children. Of course. Thanks for the super chat from Beth, who says, I think that a dragon coming from under your floor is a bad omen. Yeah, I, it's cool the way that they did that. Because, you know, dragons dragons are often depicted as, like, these subterranean beasts who, like, lurk in caves and, and jealously hoard gold, like Smaug. And so I, I think, you know, getting to see the dragons in, like, the subterranean volcanic um, habitat was really cool. Like, in the previous episode, we got to see the dragon eggs being laid in the dragon mont. Um, and we got to see, um, I think it was Dreamfire, like, under the dragon pit in uh, a previous episode when Amond went down there. And so, yeah, like, like it, it is really cool that, you know, and as we should, we are getting more glimpses of, like, what dragons are and how they work. You know, these are animals that have their own sort of bizarre magical anatomy and biology and, and, and system and, and, you know, getting to see more glimpses of that symbolically and, and in the lore is really cool. Uh, we've discussed the opening sequence. Jesus or Jesus says, did they even mourn King Viserys? Yeah, I mean, that's the that's the tragedy of all of this. Like, you know, a lot of people here really did genuinely love Viserys. Alicent really genuinely had a lot of concern for Viserys. I, I mean, I, I think that an angle that's really cool is that, like, They made it very clear, like, especially in interviews, that the reason why, or one of the main reasons why King Viserys was so determined to support Rhaenyra as his heir was because Viserys always loved his wife, Emma, his first wife, Emma, the mother of Rhaenyra, and he never stopped loving her, and ever since Emma died in that horrific C-section, Viserys felt horrifically guilty about Emma's death, and he wanted to make Rhaenyra heir as a tribute to Emma and a a penance for Emma's death. And I think that in a similar way, and maybe this is me reading too much into it, but I feel like Emma, sorry, Alicent, when Viserys died, and when Alicent thought Viserys said that he wants her son Aegon to be king, I think maybe Alicent is thinking, I must make Aegon King as a gesture of my love for Viserys. Because, you know, Alicent and Viserys had a fucked up relationship, but Alicent cared for Viserys. Alicent showed a lot of love and care for Viserys. And, you know, Rhaenyra came in last episode saying, oh, you're just manipulating him. And to some extent that might be true. But but I think, you know, Alicent was there for Viserys in a way that no one else was. And I think that Alicent loved Viserys in a way that no one else did. And so when Alicent, you know, now that she believes that Viserys wanted Aegon to be king, I think Alicent wants to honor that partly because of her love for Viserys. And it's wrong and it's misplaced, but I think that it may be a good intention. So I think that I, I liked that we got a moment where um, where we saw Viserys's body being being like mummified by the Silent Sisters, and Alicent was like crying for him and putting a crown on on Viserys's body. And and you're right that like yeah like why is why are there not more people mourning Viserys? Everyone else is off you know trying to get political advantage and trying to start wars, but Alicent is like the only one who was there mourning the death of her husband who she loved. So. I think that's another sort of sympathetic aspect to Alicent's character right now. Thanks for the super chat from Hunter, who says there's only one more episode in the season. Yeah, that's correct. 
do you envision there being a second season? Oh, there, there most certainly is a second season, Hunter. It has been officially greenlit, and it's going to take... I think the showrunners said it'll take, like, three or four seasons to tell this story. Um, and, yeah, we are just getting started. We are just getting started. Like, th- this whole first season so far has really just mostly been backstory. This has just been set up. This is about, like, learning about the characters and their history and their relationships. The main event has not even begun. Like, the whole first season has been, like, a, a family drama. It's been, like, this intimate slow, very sort of relationship-based, personality-based family drama. The later seasons are going to be a little bit different. And uh, yeah, that, that's when the real shit begins. Natalie says, Do you think it means anything that Helena purposefully looked away when they said, Behold your king? Yeah, I, Helena does not like Aegon because he is a rapist and a, and a drunkard and, and not a good person. Um, they mentioned last episode Helena saying that Aegon ignores her except for when he's drunk. And I don't imagine Aegon is nice to Helena when he is drunk. Um, and so, yeah, like, I don't think Helena is a fan of Aegon. And I, I do think it is significant, like, the, the sort of series of nods that we saw from the various characters. Like, Aegon looked at each person, and each person gave Aegon a nod in turn. Except, I think, for Aemon. Did, did Aemon not nod for Aegon? Oh no, yeah, alright, Aemon did do a little nod, but you know, there was a lot of, like, envy in that look from Aemon, because Aemon wants Aegon's throne, um, so it was, you know, it's a good sort of reminder of where yeah, and Helena looks away, it's a good reminder of where their relationships stand with all these people, like, the Greens are not, (laughs) are not a completely united front as a faction, there's plenty of divisions within as well as without, so, um, Yeah, those dynamics are going to be really important. Thanks for the super chat from Colourful, who says, How did they get all those lords in the throne room in, like, two hours to bend the knee? So, yeah, there was a scene when they shut the doors of the Red Keep and they had all these lords and they were forcing them to swear loyalty to Aegon. These lords were already at court. Like, you're right. Like, there wasn't time to, like, send out ravens and get all of these lords from all the kingdoms to come to the Red Keep. These were just courtiers and lords who were already there. That's one of the things that House of the Dragon has done a good job of emphasizing is that, like, the court is meant to be a hive of political activity. Like, it's, it's, like, in Game of Thrones, the Red Keep often seemed quite empty. But, you know, especially now in this time of, like, prosperity and, and, you know, lots of people around, there are lots of lords and courtiers and second sons and you know, a- ambassadors from afar and, and money changers and, and ambassadors and all sorts of political agents in the Red Keep trying to push for their various political agendas. Uh, and these lords are among them, I think. So that, that's that's where they came from. It's, it's kind of reminiscent of when um, Theon took over Winterfell in um, Game of Thrones, and he similarly, like, forced people to swear loyalty to him. But, like, as we saw with Alan Caswell, you know, the loyalty of of people who you, you know, force with threats, they're not really that loyal to you. So Alan tried to act against the Greens and died for it. Thanks for the super chat from Musa, who says, Amond and Kristen's relationship fascinates me. Yeah, they went on a fun little buddy mission out into the city to try and find Aegon. Um, And yeah, I mean, Kristen and Aemon, they they seem to have become close. Um, Because Kristen and Aemon, like, Kristen has been training Aemon. Um, And I think that they are similar characters in the sense that they are both... uh, They've got big chips on their shoulder. Like, Kristen feels spurned and rejected and bitter about what happened between him and Rhaenyra. And Aemon feels bitter and angry about the loss of his eye. And we learn this episode that he also feels bitter that Aegon gets to be heir to the throne when Aemon considers himself to be uh, more qualified. How do we feel about Kristen's hat, by the way? In- interesting hat there. I think it's not as cool as Rhaenyra's beanie in episode 4. But anyway, yeah, I, I think that Aemon and Kristen are a nice dynamic. Like, I think that they understand each other and and there are a lot of similarities between them and they both uh hate daemon so that's another thing that they've got in common i suppose 
um, and they are both very badass warriors. So yeah, they got they got a lot in common. Crispy Cream, Kristen Cole. Thanks for the super chat from Marty, who says, Very interesting that Alicent had to protect the king when Melis threatened the Greens. Not a good look for the king. Yeah, when Rhaenys Ra- burst out on Melis, um, the, the, the the great and powerful King Aegon II uh, cowered behind his mother, Alicent. Um, where is he? Yeah, here he is. King Aegon, the mighty wielder of the of the storied Valyrian blade Blackfire, wearing the crown of the Conqueror, standing behind his mother. And, you know, it, it's nice to see Alicent's, you know, maternal protective instincts kicking in there. Alicent putting her body on the line to protect Aegon. Not that it would help, but, you know, it's, it's nice to see Alicent being protective of Aegon, even though she hates Aegon. I really enjoyed the conversation between Aegon and Alicent, in the on, on the way to the coronation um you know and Aegon said do you love me mother and she said you're an imbecile Aegon which was such a cruel thing to say um but you know he did just rape someone last episode so maybe that's why Alicent feels that way but you know I, I thought it was so funny that that Alicent was saying oh it's this important sacred thing Viserys's dying wish is for you to be king and Aegon does not even entertain the possibility he's like no you're full of shit because Viserys never liked me and Viserys always wanted Rhaenyra to be heir and if he wanted to change his mind he could have done so at any point in the last 20 years so it's funny that Aegon is you know barely invested at all in being king he doesn't want any of this political stuff going on but it's Aegon who says the truth which is no you're full of shit (laughs) there's no way that Viserys wanted me to be king because I'm shit look at me why would anyone want me to be king this is bullshit so so Aegon is the one telling the truth which is so funny because you know Aegon because he he has it, because he's not invested and because he, he's not interested that's that's how he's able to see the situation clearly you know and he does have all this resentment towards Viserys not loving him and Alicent not loving him and and as I said I, th- I thought it was really cool how Aegon enjoyed the adoration of the common people and I think that's such a cool arc for Aegon to be this person who feels unloved he finds love for the first time in his life from the common people as king. And so that's how he becomes emotionally attached to being king when previously he didn't want to be. Thank you, Laslin. Yeah, I agree that, you know, Laris fetishizing feet makes sense, given that Laris has a deformed foot. Thank you, Derek, who says, how do you feel about Blackfire? I thought it looked great. Wish we could have seen it in Game of Thrones. Yeah, so Blackfire is the storied Valyrian blade of Aegon the Conqueror. Um, and it is um, it is an important symbol of political legitimacy. We, we have seen it a few times um, in this season. Uh, Viserys used Blackfire as a walking stick previously uh you know because Viserys is not much of a warrior I mean there's this whole thing in um in a later story about the Blackfire rebellions where you know Daemon Blackfire gets the sword Blackfire because he's a warrior um whereas his trueborn brother Daeron Targaryen did not get Blackfire because he wasn't a warrior and that's sort of similar to how Viserys has this incredible most badass sword in the world but he can't use it you know and i and i don't think aegon can either like we have not seen aegon fight particular i mean we did get that training scene where aegon was where aegon was fighting against jace um but you know aegon does not appear to be like a noted warrior whereas his little brother aemond is clearly very badass with a sword so i would speculate that you know aemond's envy of aegon includes Amon wanting Aegon's sword. I bet Amon would love to take Aegon's sword because of course Valyrian steel, it's strong and sharp and light. Valyr- every great warrior wants Valyrian steel. Uh, it's like Megor the Cruel, he he wanted Blackfire. So, you know, and there is also Dark Sister is the other important ancestral Targaryen Valyrian sword and Daemon currently has Dark Sister. Um so I bet Amon would would love to get Dark Sister if not Blackfire. So keep an eye on the Valyrian steel. I mean, one of the significant points for Valyrian steel in the main Game of Thrones show is that Valyrian steel can kill White Walkers. Other sorts can't. Um, so 
Oh, yeah, you know, I guess I guess it's not as important in House of the Dragon, unless any White Walkers turn up. Thanks for the super chat from Colorful Shadows and from Jones City, who says, Helena was the creepy kid who sees, who says random things and can see ghosts. Can probably do telekinesis and float. I think she's definitely some kind of X-Men mutant situation, Professor Xavier type thing. Um, I, want, I wonder, like, you know, like, like, presumably Helena is able to see the future. Like, you know, remember... Helena said, oh, Amond will have to close an eye in order to get a dragon, you know? Um, and presumably Helena sees the future through dragon dreams, because lots of Targaryens have dreams of the future that often involve dragons, like Daeron the Drunken and, like, uh, you know, Daenerys and Jon Snow have prophetic dreams. And um, But that's not the only way to have prophetic visions. There's also, like, the green seers can see through the magic of the old gods, and there's also people who have glass candles, like Quaith, possibly. So there's, all, there's lots of different ways to be plugged into magic. Um... And yeah, I suppose it's dragon dreams with Helena, but, uh, but but she hasn't talked about dreams is the interesting thing. Like Viserys, when he had prophetic dreams, was was talking about it as, I had a dream where this happened. Whereas Helena just sort of states it as fact. I wonder if Helena is almost having like dreams in waking life, you know? Like, like and maybe that's why she's disconnected from normal daily life. Like she seems like she's in another world half the time. I wonder if... Helena is just seeing her dreams in real time, and that's sort of part of why she's disconnected from reality. Like, because dragon dreams can drive people a bit mad in the books. Dragon dreams can torment people, like Day Dayron the Drunken. So, I, I think Helena is a cool riff on the law as being someone who has dreams but is sort of affected by them in a in a difficult way. I think um, Helena paced. <laughs> Thank you for the super chat from Disson. Yeah, Cassandra in Greek myth, Commandy says in the live chat. Yeah, wasn't was Cassandra the one who like she had the visions of the future, but no one listened to her, and she was tormented by no one listening to her, seeing the doom coming, uh, but she couldn't save herself. Yeah, def definitely some vibes there. I mean, yeah, ev ever since the bloody Greeks, there's been stories of you know oracles. You can see the future, but it never works out for you, you know? There's always a tragic, dangerous element to the prophecy, just like, you know, Alicent dangerously misinterpreting Viserys' words about prophecy. Thanks for the super chat from Desorn, who says that Rainey's bursting through the dragon pit, but choosing not to doesn't make sense. She decided not to murder a bunch of her family, and... You know, she doesn't know what's going to happen next. She doesn't know that it would prevent a war to kill all those people. Um, she, I, I, I think it's reasonable for Rainies to not murder all those people. Uh, but she did kill a lot of peasants. Thanks for the super chat from... Yeah, Trash said the same thing. Wandering Kangaroo says, I love the lines from Aegon being loved. I think Viserys being neglectful of his other children is showing. I mean, there was that line a couple of episodes ago where Viserys said... Uh, my only child. Rhaenyra is my only child. I, I think that Viserys half the time does not even remember that Aegon and Helena and Aemond exist. Um, he, he very much, like, his his brain sort of stopped at the point where Emma died, and I think that emotionally Viserys always stayed in the mindset of Emma is his wife and Rhaenyra is his child. So, yeah, I think Viserys absolutely failed as a father to Aegon and Helena and Aemond, which which is all the more tragic because, like, he he never should have had those children in the first place, you know? Like, he, he didn't need to marry Alicent and have those children in the first place. No one wanted him to marry Alicent except for Otto. Least of all, Alicent herself. Like, remember, Viserys was going against everyone's wishes when he married Alicent instead of Lena Valerion. If Viserys was serious about supporting Rhaenyra, he should have been focusing more on getting Rhaenyra married and producing heirs, which, you know, he was trying to do. But it, it was Viserys' choice to have children with Alicent that created this conflict. Um, if Viserys' pullout game was a little bit better, this war would never have happened. That's all I'm saying. Thanks for the super chat from Caesar Borg, who says, Amond believing that he should be the one taking the crown is interesting. 
also saying the Kristen is a decent man with no taste for depravity. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Clyden, who says, It's neat how the dragons are all related, like the Targaryens, and they end up being not nice to each other. Yeah, I mean, the dragons and the Targaryens, um, they are all intertwined, literally. I mean, w we've seen on all of these tapestries in the background, right, that, like, the, the Targaryens and the dragons uh, have been having incestuous sex with each other. Just as the Targaryens are, are an ancestuous messed up royal family. I, I can't even show this on YouTube, is how racy these dragon orgy murals are. Um, so yeah, yeah, the, the, the activities of the dragons reflect the, the Targaryens. And we saw, like, you know, Cyrax facing off with Caraxes in episode 2 as well. Like, yeah, the relationships between the dragons are something that I hope we get to explore more. And, you know, I've also seen the idea thrown around that, you know, maybe the reason why Caraxes has such a strange body, like the showrunners have described Caraxes as a deformed dragon because he has a super long neck and he's got wings on his hind legs and he's all a bit weird, like Jaehaerys and Jaehaera, the children of Alicent and uh, the children of Helena and Aegon, who have six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot like the the strange body shapes seem to go along with the incest like matt damon's Habsburg chin so um yeah i, I think there's definitely parallels there thanks for and, and and fundamentally it comes from their like hoarding of power like the reason why the targaryens marry themselves and only allow the dragons to be controlled by targaryens is because the targaryens are hoarding power the power in their blood, the power of the throne, the power of magic, the power of dragons. That's why they are so incestuous. And so, in a metaphorical way, you know, their their power lust um, is what leads to their downfall and their physical deformities. Like, you know, even Viserys' leprosy disease. You know, maybe that, in some sense, was a consequence of the years of inbreeding. Because, like, this... They go hard with the incest. Um... Like, you know, Aegon married both of his sisters. Aenys in the books married a Valarion, which is, you know, probably a cousin. Jaehaerys and Alysanne, siblings. Balon and Alyssa, siblings. So Viserys is like a, a super incest baby. It's a, it's a wonder he's as, as um, you know, his, his DNA is like a ball of yarn. Thanks for the super chat from Lodes, who says, where was House Stark in the throne room? Yeah, there's a bit of confusion about this this scene. There is definitely going to be conversations about the great lords of Westeros. These lords who, who bowed to Otto, they are not all the lords in the kingdom. They were just the few lords who happened to be in the Red Keep at the time. Um... We can take a look at who the, who the Great Lords are at the moment, if you'd like. Here's a political map of the Great Lords of Westeros. Like, we have met Jason Lannister, the Lord of Casterly Rock, um, and uh, we met uh, Boromund Baratheon, the father of Boros Baratheon. Boros has now taken over, at least in the books. Um, Dalton Greyjoy, the Red Kraken, is in charge of the Iron Islands. They mentioned Jane Arryn, the Lady of the Vale. Uh, Cregan Stark is up in the north. Um, and, you know, Lord Hobart Hightower and Lord Corlys Velaryon are probably the two of the most powerful lords in the realm, even though they are not officially great lords. Um, they don't rule an entire kingdom. The Hightowers are, at least in theory, subservient to the Tyrells, and the Velaryons are, at least in theory, subservient to the Targaryens. So th these are all, like, the really important lords that we're going to be having conversations about as the story goes on. Um, whereas these lords are not ultra important, like Lord Caswell and Lord Fell are not the, the people who rule the kingdom. Thanks for the super chat from Desorn and from Jess, who says, Tyland is just an upstart second son, just like Vaymond, but with a worse complex because he's a younger twin. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of talk this se this series about, like, you know, second son syndrome, how... You know, Daemon feels jealous and messed up of Viserys. Aemond feels jealous and messed up with Aegon, Vaemond, as you say. And yeah, I think we might be seeing that from Thailand. Like, maybe part of why Thailand is so eager for war 
uh, and he's been plotting with Otto to install Aegon to, you know, increase his power and get increasingly more fancy golden necklaces for himself. Is that a euphemism? Uh, I think it's this, like, second son inferiority complex, for sure. Um, and being a twin, like, you know, looking at someone who looks exactly like you, but who gets more power than you and more privilege just because he exited the womb a minute before you did is patently absurd. So, yeah, I, I think that Thailand would feel jealous of Lord Jason. Um... And I wonder if there's, like, similar dynamics with Eric and Arik, you know? I wonder who is the elder... Who is the elder brother between Arik and Eric? I wonder if Eric is the rebellious second son, and it, it was Eric who went off to Rhaenyra, whereas the elder, more sort of arrogant and privileged Arik, who decided to stay with Aegon, I wonder... Robert says that Beesbury is master of coin, not the Lannister. Ah, yes, that's true, Robert. Thank you for correcting me. I, I think I mistakenly said that Thailand was the master of coin, but at this point, Thailand is the master of ships. Uh, but we're going to need a new master of coin because the master of coin, uh, Lyman Beesbury, bees in the chat, buzz buzz, uh, is dead. So we're going to need a new master of coin. Uh, meanwhile, Jasper Wild Ironrod is the master of laws. And Orwile is the Grand Maester, um, and Otto is Hand of the King, and Thailand is Master of Ships, and Harold Westerling, the Lord Commander of the Kingsguard, has left because he thinks that the Greens are wrong in rejecting Rhaenyra and supporting Aegon. Um, so they're going to need a new Lord Commander as well. I think Alicent said that she wants Kristen to be the new Lord Commander of the Kingsguard, which is a pretty bold move, you know, making... Uh, Kristen, the Lord Commander of the Kingsguard, given that he has a history of fucking murking people in cold blood, Lyman and Joffrey Lonmouth and all these people, so, uh, uh, yeah, he's not exactly unbiased and impartial, bloody Kristen. Father Paprika says, am I daft, or does Mazaria equals Melisandre make sense? There are similarities between Mazaria and Melisandre. Like, they both come from the East, they both seem to have been slaves, they both have knowledge of things, uh, they both have a sort of higher moral purpose, uh, and Melisandre is very old. Melisandre is, like, magically hundreds of years old and is able to change her appearance. Like, Melisandre makes herself appear young when she's actually very old. So, no, you are not daft, Father Paprika. Um, it is technically possible that Mazaria is secretly Melisandre wearing a magical glamour to hide her identity. Um, I don't think she is the same person. Because, like, Melisandre is very much a red priestess who's motivated by wanting to stop the White Walkers. But I guess maybe at this point in her arc, Melisandre has not discovered the power of her law. But, I mean, she must be magical already. So, yeah, like, I mean, there's nothing in the books to suggest that Mazaria is Melisandre. I think the real reason why these characters are similar is because George Martin constantly uses similar character archetypes over and over. Um... But yeah, you, you, you're not crazy. You're not crazy. I'll note that in the books, Mazaria is described as an older woman. An old woman, a very pale old woman from Lys. Um, the White Worm. That's why they call her the White Worm. She's very pale. And um, yeah, and I don't know what that accent is supposed to be. Uh, no spoilers. Uh, thank you, Laslin and Dave, who says, Rhaenys is the best person, right? Moral, loyal, emotionally stable, everything, right? If she was queen instead of Viserys. Yeah, I, I mean, Rhaenys seems smarter than, than most of these characters. And Rhaenys seems less biased than most of these characters. Like, she's constantly telling Corlys, like, hey, like, stop getting people killed for the sake of your political ambition. Like, Rhaenys is, is willing to just fucking, like, chill and protect human life, which is something that almost every other character seems incapable of doing. Uh, so, yeah, I think I think that Rainies would make a better ruler than most of these characters. She does seem more wise. I mean, I think that part of the reason why Rainies is so wise is because she 
has lived a long time and has seen all the bullshit that other people get up to. Like, she has learned from her experiences and from the bitter taste of being rejected from the throne. Like, if Rhaenys was given the throne at the Harrenhal Council, maybe she would not have been so wise and restrained. Like, when she was younger, when she... Because remember, that was like 30 years ago. So young Rhaenys, I, you know, Ra- young Rhaenys was not the same person as old Rhaenys. Like, young Rhaenys w- was a more, you know, gung-ho, dragon rider, you know, rebel without a cause. Uh, you know, I-, I think that if she got the throne at that time, she may not necessarily have been as wise as Rhaenys is now. But, um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed th- this conversation between Rhaenys and Alicent, where Rhaenys is sort of conferring her wisdom and saying, like, hey... If you let these warmongering men control the situation, there's going to be war and disaster. So we need to take action to steer the course of events towards peace. And I think that given Rhaenys's experience and wisdom, I, I think that makes sense. And I'm really glad that that was like this really important motivating spark behind Alicent. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Mr. Itani Muli. Bees in the chat. John says that definitely wasn't the first time that transaction took place between Alicent and Laris. Yeah, I, I, I want. Yeah, you, mm, yeah. Mm, mm. Feet for um, feet for information. Yeah, I mean it could be worse, but it it could really be a whole lot better too, couldn't it? Um, yeah, it was quite gross. Um, I hope it doesn't escalate. I I hope that yeah, Alison has Alison is comfortable with it. She doesn't seem it though. Nat says lots of parallels with season one of Game of Thrones, with the death of Ned Stark versus Viserys. Noble, honorable, sympathetic men die, and then war breaks out. Yeah, there 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 are similarities. I mean, there are also a lot of similarities between um, Viserys and Robert Baratheon, like especially in the books. Um, like, Viserys in the books comes off as more of just a sort of a party boy who doesn't want to think about the politics and sort of drinks himself to death and then leaves a political clusterfuck for everyone else to deal with. It's more Hot D that made Viserys into a well-intentioned, self-sacrificing, good father. Um, and I think they did a great job of it. 44 says, what do you think happened to... Sir Harold Westerling. Yeah, I mean, he 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 walks out of the room and says, "I'm I'm not going to participate in this until there's a king for me to serve because I'm in, on the king's guard." And he reminded me a lot of Barris and Selmy. So maybe he'll he'll defect to Rhaenyra, or or maybe he's just gonna fucking retire. And yeah, it is different because Harold Westerling is dead at this point in the books. So, be interesting to see how that turns out. Kevin says, why is it that all three of Viserys' children and Aegon's unclaimed children have silver hair, but none of Rhaenyra's kids do with non-Targaryens? Um, well, as Viserys says in a previous episode, uh, nature is a thing of wonders and mysteries. I don't know, man. Do you want me to break out the Punnett squares? I I don't think there's necessarily, like, hard and fast rules with genetics in this world. Like, there is the thing with the Baratheons where the seed is strong, so, like, Rhaenys has black hair in the books because she's the daughter of Jocelyn Baratheon. Um, but, yeah, like, Rhaenyra's kids have dark hair that they got from their father, Harwin. Sometimes Targaryens have dark hair, like like Daeron the Drunkard and, and, and Daeron, and, and a bunch of characters in the books who are Targaryen have dark hair. Um, nature does all sorts of stuff. DNA's a trip. Um, and that that has been a plot point before, like, you know... Daeron Targaryen, we talked about the Blackfire Rebellions before. Part of the reason why some people rebelled against uh, Daeron is because he had dark hair. And they're like, well, you're not a Targaryen if you've got dark hair, which is absurd because, you know, genetics happens, but um, that is an issue. And it's so it is really significant that Aegon II, son of Al- Alicent and Viserys, he has that blonde hair. He looks like a Targaryen. And so that superficial appearance is really important. Um, and so Rainier is kids with Daemon, Aegon and Viserys, their blonde hair, that makes them really significant. And Jehera and Jeheris, the children of Helena and Aegon, they have blonde hair, and that's really significant. Uh, whereas Jace, Luke, and Joff have a disadvantage in that respect. 
thanks for uh, and yeah well yeah Jon Snow is another example yeah because Jon Snow um at least in the show is the son of Rhaegar Targaryen and Lyanna Stark um so Jon is a Targaryen or at least a Targaryen bastard whereas he has dark hair so you know it is possible it is possible but I mean there's also that question of like you know do you have the like you know do you have Targaryen blonde hair but also do you have Targaryen dragon riding genes and one of the issues in the books is that when Jace, Luke, and Joff were born, and they had, like, Harwin Strong's dark features, people were like, well, there's no way that Jace, Luke, and Joff are going to be dragon riders, because clearly they're not true Targaryens. But, despite that, Jace, Luke, and Joff, or Jace and Luke, do claim dragons. Um, so, you don't need the blonde hair to be a Targaryen dragon rider. But it helps. It probably helps. Um, and, and, and it is interesting, like, you know, the intermarriage of the Valerians and the Targaryens and the dragon riding genes there as well, because like Rhaena Targaryen doesn't have a dragon. Her dragon hasn't hatched, whereas Baela did. So it's like having the genes for the hair, having the genes for the dragon riding and, you know, how you're perceived in terms of your political legitimacy. I, I always really enjoy the way this series intermingles, like, you know, political, real politic issues of political legitimacy with um magic and dragons and then with the human drama and it's all such a wonderfully heady mix thanks for the super chat from fabian who says is it just me or do all the dragon eggs look the same they are different colors at least um i think they have made some effort to make the dragon eggs look different like this one is orange and this one is mossy um, looks like it's got slimed at the King Kids Choice Awards. Um, this one is darker, sort of a dark green. Uh, I think that the, the, the color of the eggs corresponds to the color of the dragon. Like, in Game of Thrones, um, the dragon eggs, like Daenerys' dragon eggs, um, correspond to the color of the dragons. Um, because... Uh, Rhaegal is green, and Viserion is white, and Drogon is black in the books, and the color of the egg corresponds to the color of the dragon, which is cute. They've even got scales and everything. Um, and, you know, there's the whole issue of, like, dragon egg petrification. Like, sometimes dragon eggs hatch, sometimes they don't hatch, and if they don't hatch, they fossilize and they turn to stone over time. Although Daenerys's dragon eggs did eventually hatch, even though they were super old. Um... And that it is possible, by the way, uh, that Dreamfire, the dragon of Helena, the eggs laid by Dreamfire, might be Daenerys's dragon eggs 170 years later. Um, possibly. Because there were some eggs that were stolen by Alyssa Farman, and she sold them to a Pentoshi cheesemonger, or she sold them to the Sea Lord of Bravos. Um, and it's hinted that those dragon eggs may have later ended up being. Daenerys's dragon eggs, and it is possible that the eggs were laid by Dreamfire. So the point is that uh, Helena Targaryen's dragon might be the mother of Daenerys Targaryen's dragons, which is kawaii. Thanks for the super chat from Fak JBF, who says that Laris and Suspicious Fires equals Summer Hall. Ooh, there's a fun theory. Because in the Game of Thrones books, one of the biggest mysteries in the whole series is the destruction of Summer Hall. And um, this was where some important characters died, and it was this just horrible, emotional tragedy that, that weakened the Targaryens uh, and resulted in the deaths of some beloved characters. Um, and it's the reason why Rhaegar is an emo. It's the reason why Rhaegar was a sad boy, because he was born at this moment of tragedy uh, and death. Um, and so, yeah, he, he like hung out at the ruins of Summer Hall and sung sad songs and was just a, just an absolute emo heartthrob uh, and got real into his feelings. And that's why that sort of eventually led to him running off with Lyanna and fathering Jon Snow. Um, but the point is that Summer Hall was this very mysterious, suspicious fire. No one knows what caused the fire. So maybe our favorite foot-loving fire, fire bug, Laris Firefly Strong, 
uh, sparked this fire just as he starts the fire to try and kill Mazaria in this episode. Um, that I, I like the theory. Uh, and of course you say, well, you know, um, the fact, like, how, how is it that Laris is still alive? Because Summer Hall happens like a hundred years later. Well, there are some vague hints, or rather wild speculation, that Laris might be a, a, a green seer. Uh, who can connect with the magic of the old gods. And like our friend Bloodraven, uh, who is the three-eyed crow who trains Bran Stark in the ways of the old gods, um, like Bloodraven, Bloodraven extends his life for a hundred years by connecting in with the weirwoods and like becoming one with the, with the hive mind of the old gods and the children of the forest. Um, and that allows him to live for a very long time and to continue to, um, to continue to influence events from afar. So, uh, maybe Laris Strong, after his shenanigans in House of the Dragon, goes and plugs into the Weirwood Net and survives for long enough to continue meddling, um, and causes Summerhall. <laughs> Hashtag Laris did Summerhall. And, you know, maybe he did that on the Isle of Faces, because the Isle of Faces is the most significant uh, sacred holy site of the Old Gods in the South, and it just happens to be literally next door to, I mean, not literally, but right real close to Laris Strong's house, Harrenhal. So y- y- you're not even being crazy, Fak. You're not daft. I love it. Um, why would Laris do it? I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, maybe Laris is still there on the Isle of Faces in the main Game of Thrones series. I mean, maybe Laris is one of the Green Seers who we see with Bloodraven in Bloodraven's Cave. Um, because, you know, Bloodraven is not the only Green Seer, um, in the, in the cave. Like, we see a bunch of other Green Seers, and most of them seem to be children of the forest. But, like, there's, there's a bunch of people who are, like, creepily wired into the Matrix, um, and maybe Lara Strong is one of them, you know? Maybe Lara Strong is, like, subsumed into the hive mind. And it sort of makes sense with, you know, Lara Strong being a clubfoot, you know, being someone who can't walk around much. That's very similar to Bran, right? Because part of why Bran embraces the magical power of the old gods is because he can't get power and he can't get freedom because of the limitations of his physical body. So he instead embraces his psychic, immaterial power. So maybe Laris would do the same. And, you know, Laris is a voyeur, um, or, you know, he loves looking at feet. If Laris plugged into the Weirwood Network and was therefore able to watch and surveil the entire world at all times, Laris could look at all the feet he wants if he was plugged into the all-seeing Weirwood net. So, um, yeah, uh, that was your tinfoil corner, sponsored by FAC JBF. Thanks for the super chat. <laughs> Th- uh, thank you for the super chat from Spirits, who says the beast below the boards is the Red Queen. Yeah, we've had a couple of people say that. I agree. It's a great idea that Melis bursting up from the floor might be what Helena was talking about with the beast below the boards. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Smythe. We, all right, we got a lot of Laris did summer hall agreement. Thanks, uh, Daewoo, who says no man is so accursed as the Kinslayer. And yeah, that that's a good point, Daewoo. That in the previous episode, we you know we had this big emphasis on Rhaenys being traumatized by all of the death in her life. Like both of her children, Lena and Lainor, have died, or she thinks Lainor is dead. And her husband Corlys is on his deathbed, and she's, you know, really horrified by all of this death. Um, And so it makes perfect sense that, you know, she would not want to go out and murder people when she's in this mindset of being so hurt um, by all of the death. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Matthew says, how long does Aegon remain controllable when he realizes that crowds of screaming people will give him love? that he feels like he never got from his parents? Great question, Matthew. Um, because, you know, up until now, it seemed as though Aegon might be controllable, yeah. Like, if Aegon just doesn't care about politics, yeah, it, we could totally see him being just controlled by um, Otto and Alicent. In the same way that, like, you know, Joffrey, uh, 
was this horrible person who liked hurting people and who, you know, Cersei and Tywin attempted to control. But, you know, the Cersei and Tywin often had difficulty controlling Joffrey. There's lots of similarities between Otto and Tywin and Aegon and Joffrey and uh, Cersei and Alicent. Lots of similarities there. So, you know, will will they be able to control Aegon or will he be a, a giant fucking problem like Joffrey was? I think that's a great question. And, you know, Aegon is not someone who practices a lot of restraint, is he? Like, you know, he goes to the fighting pits, he fathers bastard children, um, he sexually assaults people. So Aegon is not someone who's going to use power with wisdom and restraint. Like, I mean, Aegon says, I'm not qualified. Don't make me king. I'll be a bad king. So, you know, he he was warning them. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think they're about to find out just how bad a king can be. I, I thought it was interesting that they called Viserys... Viserys the Peaceful. Like, kings often get epithets. 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 Um, words to describe what they were like. Like, Aegon was the conqueror. Magor was the cruel. Aegon IV was the unworthy. Ares was the mad king. Jaehaerys was the conciliator. And Viserys is apparently the peaceful. I wonder what what kind of king Aegon will be if he manages to cling on to his new throne. What will his epithet be? What will Rhaenyra's epithet be if she gets the throne? Um, be cool to find out. I, I did hate Bran the Broken. <laughs> like, like, in Game of Thrones Season 8. Like, calling Bran the Broken is such a fucking downer as, like, the climax of the series. And it's so sort of insulting to Bran. Like, it's such a neg to call him the Broken. Like, are you serious? Like, what? What, what, what is that meant to mean thematically? What, what a sad, wet fart to end the most popular TV show of the last decade. Anyway, um, Viserys the Lego Builder in the chat, <laughs> Aegon the Drunk, Laris the Toe, <laughs> Aegon the Vicious, Aegon the Nightmare, Bran the Paste Eater, Rhaenyra the Entitled, Aegon the Mummer's Boy, lots of good brainstorming going on in the live chat, Viserys the Crusty Dusty, oh boy. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Alexander, who says, Is Helena supposed to be autistic? She has traits. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to try to diagnose a fictional character. Um, I'm not going to crack out the DSM. Um, but it was interesting to see in the previous episode when Daemon killed Vaemond, uh, and Helena's reaction was to put her hands over her ears um, and I have heard that, like, feeling overwhelmed by sounds and stimulus, um, is a symptom of, like, autism spectrum disorder. And, yeah, social difficulties, and, yeah, I I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try and diagnose her. But, yeah, like, I think that there may be some, um, I think that might be what's going on here. I mean, it's like, um, Stannis, like, a lot of people speculate that Stannis Baratheon is, um autistic or Asperger's or whatever because Stannis also has like social difficulties and he has a great adherence to rules and like following procedures um and a lot of people love Stannis for that and I think that a lot of people love Helena for the way that she is as well and I think that that's lovely but I mean they also at the same time are playing into the like autistic savant trope right like, I think that a lot of fantasy stories fall into this, like, if you are a neurotypical, if you are neuri neurodivergent, then you are psychic. <laughs> and it is kind of insulting that it's like, if you are different or if you are disabled, then you must have superpowers and that's what, that's what redeems you. And that's a bit fucked up because, like, people in the real world who are disabled usually don't have psychic powers, so it's kind of like... You know, are you saying that disabled people or neurotypical, a neurotypical people are only worthy if they have superpowers? Like, that's kind of a messed up message, but, you know, I'm not going to soapbox. Thank you for the super chat from Maria, who says, I was expecting this episode to be much more action-packed, but it seems like they're saving everything the f for the finale. 
Yeah, so, you know, traditionally in Game of Thrones, uh, episode nine was often the battle episode, like the Blackwater episode or the Cersei... Oh, well, no, that was in episode 10. But yeah, often episode nine is, is the big battle action sequence. But, you know, House of the Dragon season one is a very different beast to Game of Thrones in a lot of ways. So I, we should not always expect it to follow that same structure. And, and I think what they're doing here is that episode 9 is all about the Greens, all about Alicent and Otto and Aegon, whereas the finale next week is going to be about the Blacks, which is Rhaenyra and her family, um, which is a really interesting way to do it. I, I think they're doing it almost like a two-part finale. Like, in instead of doing one big finale episode, they're doing two sides of one finale split into two halves, which I think is really interesting from the whole sort of, like perspective angle you know like two different sides of history like this is the green perspective and then we're going to get the black perspective and it's going to be like two different views of the same situation so i i think that that's an interesting way to do it i think they've really put some thought into this guys like i've said it before but my god it, it just really feels like this show has been written by people who care about the story and have thought about it and are drawing from what's good in the books which is what you should expect, but it didn't always feel like what we got in the later seasons of Game of Thrones. So um, I've really been pleasantly surprised by this show so far. Matt says, do Targaryens not have their own army? Are they only from what lords swear to them? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I I'm not as expert on some of the military matters of this series as some people are. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's any mention of like a Targaryen standing army. I, I think the closest thing is that there are lords in the crown lands. And the crown lands, um, I mean, you know, the Valarions and, and the Keltgars and the and the Stokeworth and Rosby and like all, all at Maidenpool, all, all of these like, you know, towns, um, and places around King's Landing, they are lords and houses that are sworn directly to House Targaryen. Like, they are not in the Seven Kingdoms, they are in the Crown Lands. So I think the closest thing to a Targaryen army is the, um, is the armies of these petty lords who are sworn to the Targaryens. Like, in theory, the Targaryens can just holler and all these lords will bring their armies right there, ready to go. Um, I mean, there's also the City Watch of King's Landing, the Gold Cloaks, who we saw Daemon leading earlier on. And the Gold Cloaks are a sort of a private army in King's Landing owned by the Targaryens. Uh, but of course, you know, the loyalties of all of those um, factions are not beyond question. I mean, it's like, I think in this episode, uh, someone said, like, you know, some of the Gold Cloaks commanders are loyal to us, the Greens, but some of these... Uh, gold cloak commanders uh, are still loyal to Daemon. So that's an issue that has already been discussed is like, you know, when we get to the pointy end, who will the gold cloaks support? Um, so yeah, uh, I, I think that these are some of the conversations that Thailand and Jasper and Otto have been having. Like, wh who can we rely on? Who are our allies? Who can we draw on? Um, and yeah, so the Gold Cloaks and the Crown Lands Lords are some of the most immediately available soldiers here. Thanks for the super chat from... Oh, well, Matt also asks, do you have an all-time favorite character from the books or shows? I, I like a lot of the minor characters, like Alaras slash Sorella is really fun. Um, in terms of main characters, I think Tyrion is the most richly detailed character, and we've got a video called The Real Tyrion Lannister that goes deep into that. Um, and I I've also got some love for uh, Lord Hightower in the uh, main books, who just hangs out in the Hightower reading magic books all day with his mad maid, Ormond Hightower, I think. He seems cool. Thanks for the super chat from Adam, who says, yeah, we've we've talked about Rainey, so I'm not going to re-answer the same question a million times. Um, Tambuli points out that, you know, Rainey's bursting out with her dragon is also like a, you know, it's a defiant, badass act of saying like, yeah, you tried to lock me up, you tried to imprison me in my chambers, so I'm going to burst the fuck out and defy your control. Yeah, that's... 
absolutely an angle there. Yeah, Leighton Hightower, that's right. Leighton Hightower was who I was talking about. Um, thanks for the super chat from Jedi Stooge, who says that Alicent was more brave than Aegon. I, I don't think Aegon is suddenly going to become a more brave and heroic person. I, I think Aegon has always taken the path of least resistance. He always has just taken, like, the easiest path towards immediate gratification, and that's why he drinks and does sexual misadventures and goes to child pit fights. I, I think that Aegon is not suddenly going to become a hardworking noble person. Um, but it will be fascinating to see how the crown changes him, because crowns do change uh, the the kings who wear them in Game of Thrones. So it'll be interesting to see that. Thanks for the super chat from Andrew, who says, Rhaenys must have overheard Alicent talking to Otto. Reluctance to murder is not weakness. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that Rhaenys showed restraint by not murdering all those people. Yeah, that's a good point. Jess says, Amond thinks that he's next in line to the throne after Aegon. Do his two sons, Jaehaerys and Maelor, not count? Yeah, so... Amon seems to think that he deserves the throne, and he sees himself as Aegon's heir, despite the fact that Aegon has two children, Jehera and Jaehaerys. And yeah, by the laws of inheritance, um, Aegon's heir is Jaehaerys, his, his eldest male. Um, I mean, but, you know, as we saw with Daemon, you know, there are often various opinions about inheritance. Does an uncle come before a daughter? Does a cousin come before a nephew, there's all sorts of complicated interpretations. And I mean, Amon, like, the succession has, has been weird, con like, it's been consistently inconsistent ever since Aegon the Conqueror, um, because, you know, Magor stole the throne from Aenys's child, and then, you know, Jaehaerys skipped Rhaenys and gave it to Balon, and then Viserys got it, which sets a male precedent, but then... Rhaenyra was meant to have it, which sets a female precedent. So, like, the whole inheritance thing has been uh, wibbly-wobbly for years. So, you know, it's not surprising that Aemon thinks that he can get the throne. But, yeah, you're right, Jess, that, in theory, Jaehaerys or Jaehaera should be Aegon's heir, not Aemond. But, you know, if you think that's going to stop Aemond, <laughs> we might have another thing coming. Salif says, doesn't Amond love his brother? I mean, a a Amond was bullied by Aegon. Like, remember when Amond got the pink dread um, in episode... episode... seven? Um, he, he was being bullied by Aegon along with um, the other kids. Yeah, episode six, sorry. Um... Aemon had a shit time from Aegon, and, you know, we, we saw, like, he he dislikes Aegon for, you know, not taking anything seriously and just drinking and hitting on girls, whereas Aemon sees himself as, like, a more rightful, dutiful kid. And there's also an element of what seems like a hint of envy that, that Aegon marries Helena, whereas Aemon said, I would have happily married Helena. So some people are thinking that, well, maybe... Amond has a crush on Helena, who is his sister, but, you know, Targaryen incest. Um, and maybe Amond wants Helena, and it wouldn't be the first time Targaryens have fought over their sister. So, yeah, there may be some um, incestuous romantic rivalry stuff going on. Some people have wildly speculated that maybe Helena's children are actually Amond's children. Because, you know, Aegon has been going off and you know, having sex with people at the child pit fighting zone and whatever. Um, and Helena says that Aemon... A Helena says that Aegon ignores her except for when he's drunk. And that sounds a bit like uh, Robert Baratheon's relationship with Cersei, where Cersei says that Robert never came and had sex with me except for when he was drunk. And when Robert was wasted, I just finished him off with my hands, and so he never got me pregnant. Meanwhile, Cersei was actually having her children with Jaime. And we could speculate that maybe something similar is happening with Aegon and Helena. Like, maybe 
Aegon is not impregnating Helena because he's drunk and she's avoiding it, and maybe the actual person getting Helena pregnant is her brother Aemond. There's a lot of... (laughs) There's a lot of incest, but this is the sort of stuff that goes on in these books. And uh, yeah, it is, it is not, there's no proof, but it is interesting speculation that Helena's children may actually be Amon's. And it introduces, you know, that would mean that those children are bastards, just like Rhaenyra's sons, Jace, Luke, and Joff, are bastards. And that would create a whole other microcosm of uh, corruption and insanity and illegitimacy on the green side of the equation. So that, that's an interesting theory. Uh, poll. Yeah, good point, Frito. Let's do a poll. Do you guys... Who do you support? Um, Rhaenyra and Team Black? Or Alicent and Aegon and, and Team Green? There is now a poll in the live stream. You can vote who you support, Rhaenyra and Alicent. Uh, Rhaenyra versus Alicent. I think in the pre, I think last week we did a poll. It was like eighty-seven percent in support of Rhaenyra. I think. So let's see what the numbers are this time. I mean, this time was all focused on Alicent's side. So you know, you'd think that this might make us more sympathetic to Alicent. I think Alicent herself was pretty sympathetic because she was very clear about not wanting to murder people this episode, and she was talking about the greater good. But you know, she also fundamentally was crowning Aegon on the false belief that Viserys wanted Aegon to be king. And, uh, you know, we saw more of how evil Aegon is with his child pit fight and his bastard children who were living in squalor there. Um, And that is who Alicent is supporting. Meanwhile, Rhaenyra is not even aware of everything that's going on right now. I mean, Rhaenyra... I mean, last episode made Rhaenyra look good because Rhaenyra was the one who was offering an olive branch to Alicent and who was trying to reconcile. Currently, the numbers say 88% support Rhaenyra and 12% support Alicent. That's with uh, 2,000 votes in. So, yeah, still overwhelming support for Rhaenyra, not for Alicent. Pretty similar numbers. Uh, Some people in the the live chat saying that, you know, you, you can't even really evaluate Team Green as a whole, like, because... Otto and Alicent are now against each other in a lot of ways. Like, they they were butting heads and they wanted to do things differently. So, yeah, like, Team Green is not a monolith, and neither is Team Black. So, yeah, it's not as simple as one side or the other. Thanks for the super chat from Sola, who says, Would it be fair to say that Rhaenys was wearing her red and black armor under her cloak that whole morning? Yeah, well, she did do a pretty quick wardrobe change to get into that armor on her dragon, didn't she? Um, Yeah, pretty impressive stuff. Maybe she had, you know, Velcro clothes that she could rip off. Um, Yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm glad she had the armor, though. And, you know, yeah, the red and black colors, those are like Targaryen colors, and they're also more associated with Rhaenyra, because Rhaenyra is the Targaryen versus Alicent, the green Hightower. So, you know, she didn't kill the greens, but she was wearing the... she was wearing Rhaenyra's colors there. Um, Thanks for the super chat from SB Tin, who says, Do the other crowns have names like Aegon's? Yeah, so there is there is history to these crowns. Um, the crown that we saw Viserys wearing and the crown that we saw in this episode um, was originally Jaehaerys's crown, uh, and that crown, at least in the books, was given to Jaehaerys by the Faith of the Seven. Um, and in the books, it's described as being gold with a bunch of, like, jewels, and it's got, like, the, the seven gods on it. Um, in Hot D, it's got, like, the Tully sigil and, like, all of the Great Houses sigils on it. So it's a change from the books, but it emphasizes, like, the conciliator bringing together and uniting all of the great houses of the realm together, um, which I think is also nice and appropriate for Jaehaerys. And so, you know, it emphasizes how Viserys continued Jaehaerys' legacy as a unifier and as a peacemaker. And, you know, Viserys fumbled that legacy and Viserys ultimately left the realm more divided. But that's what the crown represents. Whereas the crown of Aegon the Conqueror is made of Valyrian steel with rubies. It's like blood and fire. It's Valyrian. It's warlike. So, you know, Aegon's crown has has very different symbolism behind it. 
Um, and we may we might we may ask the question of if Aegon is wearing uh, Aegon's crown, then what happens to Viserys and Jaehaerys's crown? Uh, Jew likes Alicent and says, "I like the imagery of a room full of plotting, sharp-witted plotters." The old person who they thought wasn't worth keeping in the loop defied them. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Like, like Lyman Beesbury was not aware of Tyland and Jasper and Otto's plotting. Like, they must have deliberately not included him. Like, there was an interesting line where, where the men said to Alicent, Oh, you know, we, we didn't tell you about our plans because we didn't want to sully you. You know, oh, you're only a woman. There's no need for you to know these things. It's like in the books. In the books... In the books, Laris Strong is at this meeting, and Laris says, Hey folks, let's do a blood oath. And they all cut their hands and, and hold their hands together to swear a secret bond of brotherhood to support Aegon and make Aegon king. Um, but Alicent was not included in the boy's blood oath um, because she's a woman. On account of her sex, she was not included in, in the blood oath. Um which, you know, it doesn't sound very, very COVID safe anyway, but but yeah, like Alicent being excluded on the basis of her gender is something that the books have always been interested in, going back to, you know, Cersei, etc. Um, it's interesting that Orwile is still, you know, quietly present. Um, Orwile was not stupid enough to stand up and defy the Greens and get killed like Lyman was. Like, I think that, that Orwile quietly said to... Lyman, like, hey, like, hush up, or they're gonna kill you. So I wonder what Orwell's role is going to be going ahead, because, like, even in the previous episode, we saw that Orwell was, like, not super on board, um, stealing Driftmark for Vaymond instead of Luke. Um, I wonder if Orwell might have Valerion heritage. I wonder where he's from. Um, because that's another change from the books, Orwell being black. Um, but yeah, Orwell is, like, quietly, like, not okay with what's going on with the Greens, and I wonder if he's going to continue to go along with them, or I wonder if he's going to defy them. There's there's a whole storyline in the books about, like, who gets to be the next Grand Maester, and, like, Rhaenyra supports one Maester, and Alicent supports another Maester, and it's this whole other sort of, like, little subplot that happened earlier that they didn't include in the show. Uh, Bill says, who else is curious about how Sir Laris Strong broached the feet voyeurism request to Alicent? I, I, I don't want to know, personally. <laughs> but yeah, it's like, 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 yeah, it's like how, do you, how do you bring it up? How, how, do you, how do you bring it up to the Queen that, hey, I'd really love to see your feet, and also I have secret information? Maybe, maybe that's exactly how Laris asked. Uh, yeah, we talked about the succession. Domi says, during Viserys' last moments, he is actually seeing the mother who he mistakes for Emma. Ooh, you're saying that he actually saw the the god of the faith of the seven in the visage of the mother, and he sort of thought that it was Emma, but it wasn't. The faith of the seven finally actually wielding some magical influence in this world? Maybe. Maybe someone was entering his dreams. People with glass candles can enter each other's minds. There's lots of, you know, hints of magic being able to manipulate people's minds in this world. And, you know, this should be a magical time because magic is tied to dragons and there are lots of dragons around at the moment. So you'd think that there should be all sorts of sorcery afoot. I do wonder if we're going to see more magic in the story. There's not a lot of magic in the books around this time, but, you know, we'll see if there's any going on quietly in the show. Uh, Kale feels insulted by the Laris scene. Thank you, William. Thank you, Renan, who says uh, Eric was disturbed. Yeah, Eric and Arik sort of went back and forth. I was not always keeping track of which one was Eric and which one was Arik personally. All right, uh, we're going to wrap up this live stream shortly. Uh, we've been talking for two and a half hours. Um, so I'm going to quickly answer as many of your super chats as I can. I apologize if I don't get to all of them. And then we're going to have a brief look at the on the next episode preview trailer. 
Um, are there any other things that I wanted to talk about? I thought it was funny how Thailand was like totally failing to read the room when he uh, like walked in and said, "All right, what 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 what'd you drag me out of bed for? What, what why couldn't this wait an hour? Why have we got to have a meeting in the middle of the night?" And he just totally failed to read the room and failed to see how you know Otto and Alison and Kristen are looking stony faced because the king has just died and Thailand's just totally failed. And it's, yeah, again, like I think Thailand has become much more of a douche than he used to be um and you know also there was that whole thing with talia like allison's maid and you know talia lit those candles in that window to indicate to mazaria that the king is dead um so just as otto and the men have been planning for ages like what to do when viserys dies uh talia and mazaria have also been planning all along yeah, in the books, by the way, uh, Mushroom suggests that Alicent poisoned Viserys, which is clearly not true in Hot D. But, uh, well, I mean, maybe all that milk of the poppy was bad for him, actually. Because in the books, it seems as though um, Littlefinger is deliberately drugging Sweet Robin, John uh, Robert Aaron, uh, in order to make him die more quickly. Um, and so maybe, like, Otto was sort of getting the maesters to, like, really dose Viserys up with Milk of the Poppy. Maybe Otto wanted Viserys to die sooner, even if Alicent maybe didn't. Um, yeah, I liked Mazaria projecting kids. Yeah, I, I liked... Uh, th- there was a line where someone said that Aegon is fleeing what other men die seeking. Like, Aegon was literally trying to run away from being the king. Um, and Otto says, I think it was Otto who said that, like, oh, you're fleeing what other men die seeking. Like, some people want the throne so much they'll die for it, and you're running away from it. And it's like, from Aegon's perspective, well, duh. You know, he's running away from it because people die for this throne. He doesn't want to die for this throne. Like, it's so funny that in some ways Aegon is the most despicable evil character because he hurts other people and has no interest in other people's feelings. But Aegon is also the guy who's saying some truths. Uh, which is that the throne is terrible and no one should want it and he is unqualified, you know? Um, so, yeah. Uh, Jess points out Aegon's golden dragon sigil. Yeah, we, we, we did get a glimpse of the golden dragon. Because one of the issues... Um, well, yeah, now we won't spoil anything, but um, heraldry is important. How do you identify the different factions? And it looks like Aegon is opting for a golden dragon as his personal sigil, which is something that people do. Sometimes they take on a personal heraldry to identify themselves. And so Aegon is the golden dragon. And that's because he has the golden dragon Sunfire. Sunfire the Golden uh, is Aegon's dragon. And it's said to be the most beautiful dragon in the world of all time. So there Aegon is riding Sunfire with his golden dragon heraldry. And this is artwork by Rudolf Hema, which I think is really lovely. Uh, Deeb says that a lot of the nobles are wearing these low-hanging chains on their clothing. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's been a lot of that. Like, Alicent has been wearing some of those prominently. A lot of people with some heavy golden necklaces, which I'm enjoying. But yeah, Otto also is wearing this chain. It all, like, I think that in Otto's case, it sort of evokes the Maester's chain and hints of the connection between the High Towers and the Maesters who are based in Old Town. Um, but I think, you know, with Alicent, the chain sometimes suggests Alicent's, like, restraint. Like, Alicent feels so restricted by rules and expectations and courtesy and pressures and gender and religion so she she feels chained so yeah i think there's lots of interesting symbolism with the chains for sure um radnage says that laris strong has a weakness for feet a feetness Mm. Uh, Eddie asks about the beast under the boards. Uh, I think that, you know, without spoiling anything, like, it definitely evokes the secret passages, the spies, all of the agents inside the Red Keep. Um, And it may connect to Melis bursting through the ground, but I think we will learn more about the beast beneath the boards. Wambulance says, it's wild that Rhaenys didn't kill Team Green. Yeah, look, she... They don't know the future. She doesn't want to be a murderer. 
and she and, and Rainey's just had this conversation with Alicent. Rainey's is trusting Alicent to do the right thing, you know? Like if Rainey's hadn't had this conversation with Alicent, maybe she would have barbecued the greens. But, you know, th- they had a real connection here, and and I think that Rainey's is trusting Alicent and kind of threatening Alicent to do the right thing and to not let this spiral out of control, and we will see how that goes down. Um Ondrex says that every Targaryen bastard is a potential dragon rider, is it not? Yes, that's a great point, Ondrex, because, yeah, like, we saw that Aegon has this uh, bastard child in the rat pits. Where where the hell was that bastard? Um, there was this little blonde kid, and if that is the bastard child of Aegon Targaryen, then that child might be a potential dragon rider, and we do have a bunch of dragons uh, lying around without riders like sea smoke and vermithor and silverwing and and others um so yes uh just as you know they're trying to like just as daemon is hoarding dragon eggs on dragonstone we're gonna need riders for those eggs so so those are all relevant questions uh, Nick says, imagine Varys and Littlefinger during this ordeal. I, I feel like Littlefinger would definitely want to see Alicent's feet. I think there's a lot of similarities between Laris and Littlefinger for sure. Um, I think that I think that Varys might be a bit smarter about all of this than, than Laris is. But anyway, uh, v- Vixero says, why isn't the question of which Aegon Viserys was talking about being discussed? Um, well, Alicent interpreted Viserys' words as referring to her son, Aegon. But yeah, like, it is hilarious that this entire conflict might not be happening if Viserys was more clear. Uh, Well, and if the Targaryens didn't all name their children Aegon. Because yeah, like, just to be clear, Aegon the Conqueror, the founder of the Targaryen dynasty in Westeros, is called Aegon. Uh, Aenys, King Aenys had a child called Aegon, the Uncrowned. Now uh, Viserys and Alicent have a kid called Aegon, and now Rhaenyra and Daemon have a kid called Aegon, and there are many more Aegons later in the story, so um, it's a fucking mess. They need to stop naming their kids Aegon. Um, And yeah, it's a bit silly. Cole says, "Isn't uh, isn't it a bit sexist that Alicent is being antagonized for reacting similarly to Rhaenyra's bastards? as Ned Stark probably would have. Yeah, there absolutely are parallels between Alicent and Ned, because just like Ned, Alicent is standing up and saying, hey, we should not let these bastards unlawfully take the throne. That's against the rules. We should not stand for it. So yeah, like, there abs- there is a, um, you know, Alicent is standing up for the truth in that respect. Um, I think that Alicent, one of the differences though, is that, you know, Alicent is supporting Aegon, who is a terrible person, and trying to put him on the throne, um, and Alicent, you know, attacked Rhaenyra with a knife, and, you know, Alicent ordered for Luke's eye to be cut out, so, you know, there are some very villainous aspects to Alicent's character, um, but yeah, like, I'm sure there's also, like, a gendered aspect to it as well, and that's definitely something that the show is exploring. Thanks for the super chats from Arthur and Dean and Anastasia, who says, Did Laris stay and talk to Otto off screen? Yeah, that was an interesting conversation. We'll investigate that later for the explained video. Everybody like and subscribe, by the way. There's going to be a shorter, edited, scripted video exploring the episode later in the week. Christopher says, did Mazaria know the king died when the candle was lit? Yes. Talia works for Mazaria, and Talia lit these candles in order to tell Mazaria that the king is dead. It's a little bit like um, Brienne was watching for the candles being lit in Winterfell from Sansa in Game of Thrones. Anon says, it's interesting to see the division in the Greens. I agree. It, I think this internal division between Alicent and Otto is really important. And it makes Alicent more virtuous. Because in the books, it doesn't talk about a division between Alicent and Otto. Um, but it's easy to see how that division might have been papered over by the historians. Um, and it definitely makes Alicent more moral to have her oppose Otto's um, eagerness for war. Thanks, James and Rhaenys, who says, Why was Rhaenys still hanging around King's Landing when everyone else returned to Dragonstone and Driftmark? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, 
I mean, Rhaenyra was leaving specifically to take the kids home because she didn't want Jace, Luke, and Joff to fight with Alicent's kids. Rhaenyra's intention was to stay in King's Landing. I mean, maybe Rhaenys, like everyone else, had a suspicion that King Viserys was going to die soon, and Rhaenys wanted to make sure that the outcome was good for her family when the king died. So, you know, I think everyone was sort of gravitating towards the throne, and Rhaenys, Rhaenyra was planning on coming back as well. Uh, thanks for the... Super- uh, well, yeah, and Vaymond was going to have a funeral, presumably, so that's another good reason to stay there. Cole says... Yeah, we answered that. Dylan says, do you think there's significance to the brothel madam who recognizes Amond? Yeah, that was an interesting interaction, wasn't it? Um, She was sort of saying that, yeah, like Aegon used to come here, but uh, he decided that our establishment was too fancy for him, so he went to the rat pits instead. And it seemed like, yeah, she showed some confidence and some knowledge and some poise, so I wonder if we might see her again. I don't think we got a name for her in the subtitles. But yeah, I really like how they're sort of fleshing out this sort of underbelly in King's Landing, and I I hope that we'll see more of it. It's, 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 it's an interesting sort of class thing, because like we see the lowest pits of Flea Bottom, and we see the upscale Street of Silk, and we see in the royal court, and we see the sort of different kinds of depravity that goes on at these various levels of society, you know, and um, yeah, it's going to be cool to see how that plays out. Jeffrey says, how has no one caught on to Helena's psychic visions? I mean, the, the saddest part is that Viserys was super obsessed with prophecy and dreams. I mean, I guess later in his life, Viserys had sort of sworn off the visions because his his vision about having a son is what got Emma killed in a lot of ways. Um, but it's so sad that Viserys never said, hey, Helena, my daughter, you have dragon dreams. That's so cool. I used to have dragon dreams. Let's be friends. Let's be an actual father and daughter. Uh, so yeah, it is so sad that no one listens to Helena and I wonder if someone ever will. Reg says, was it dumb for Westerling to draw his sword and do nothing when Cole drew his? Uh, I thought it was kind of dumb that, like, Kristen, like, killed Lyman Beesbury, and then Harold Westerling, or maybe before, he was like, well, take off your cloak, Cole, like, you are no longer a king's guard, and then Cole just ignored that, and then Harold just walked out, so, you know, I... Yeah, I, I think that Harold considers Kristen Cole and Green, and the entire Green side to be, like, no longer the legitimate Kingsguard, and that's why he left. Um, maybe the only reason why Harold didn't, like, disarm Kristen or kill Kristen was because Harold felt outnumbered in that case. And, you know, I, I really liked that, you know, part of why Harold is against the Greens is because Harold was the protector of Rhaenyra. We got some really nice moments between Harold and Rhaenyra. Like, Harold was clearly really fond of Rhaenyra, and he was very, very aware that that Rhaenyra was the chosen heir of Viserys, and I think Harold respected Viserys as well. So, you know, like, it is a change to have Harold involved in these events, and I think it's a good change, because Harold has, like, some real personal reasons to make these decisions. So, yeah, I, I enjoyed Harold's role so far. 8 says, original Game of Thrones was too tough to watch for me, so I've enjoyed listening to you discuss it. Thanks, 8. Stephen says, I enjoy the nuance they gave Otto during the coronation scene. He was yelling for the doors to open. Yeah, that that was kind of curious, like when Rhaenys and her dragon were in the dragon pit and Otto was shouting for the doors to open, which I guess was Otto saying, like, let's let the dragon out. <laughs> You don't want you don't want a dragon feeling trapped in a, in a room with you, or you're gonna die. So maybe that's what was going on there. But um, yeah, Otto. I mean, Otto as ever seemed to be the more practical person in that situation. He was trying to solve the problem, and uh, he couldn't fight the dragon, so he was trying to get it out. Radnedge says, "How many highborns is Kristen Cole going to be allowed to kill in broad daylight? Is there a three strike system?" Will Beesbury's family demand retribution? Good question. I mean, one of the issues in the book is 
what happened to Beesbury? Because, like, like the whole issue here is that the Greens are, like, locking down the Red Keep. They're not letting anyone in or out. They don't want anyone to even know that the king is dead until they're ready to crown Aegon. Um, and, you know, no one, none of the Greens are going to want to publicize the fact that, like, Beesbury was murdered at the table. Um, so in the book, Fire and Blood, because the book plays with this idea of, like, historical accuracy and disputed sources, you know, Mushroom claims, oh, they threw Beesbury out a window, and another person says, no, they slit Beesbury's throat. But, but one of, I think it was either Eustace or Orwell said, uh, no, no, they just locked Beesbury in the dungeons. So, you know... Uh, throughout future events like some of the uh, the world doesn't know that Beesbury was murdered and the Greens aren't going to tell Beesbury's family oh yeah we murdered your your dad like no so yeah I, that's a good question Radnedge and um, I think for now the Greens are trying to keep it under wraps and you know I mean that does also raise the whole question of how did Kristen get away with killing Joffrey Lonmouth and you know some people have speculated that like you know maybe Alicent and Kristen will say that, oh, Joffrey Lonmouth pulled a knife and was was trying to attack Rhaenyra or something. Like, they could just make up some lie. Like, you know, I hate to break it to you, but sometimes people in positions of power do bad things and cover it up and lie. And sometimes corrupt people remain in positions of power. Um, so maybe that's what happened here, you know? Like, I, I, I for one, am not shocked. Uh, Mike says... Am I the only one who can't wait until Mexican Jon Snow gets his? I don't know what you're talking about, Mike, but I thank you. Uh, Beep Boop uh, says Melis's head armor has 9 billion HP. Yeah, I mean, how exactly did Melis break through the floor of the dragon pit? <laughs> um, and isn't that going to be a problem that there's a giant hole in the dragon pit now? Like... Man, it's gonna be a pain in the ass to rebuild that. What about all? The, what about all the other dragons down there? Like, uh, are all the other dragons down there like looking up through the hole, going like, "What the fuck is going on?" While while peasants rain down on their heads. Yeah, Rainis has created a bit of an architectural issue redecorating all the feng shui in the dragon pit is messed up now. Lowell says, "Yeah, I agree with you, Lowell." John says. Can Amond use a dragon well, considering his complete lack of depth perception? Yeah, I mean, well, Amond doesn't seem to have any trouble, like, deflecting Kristen's flail in in mid-flight, despite not having any depth perception. So, Amond seems untroubled by his loss of an eye. Um, maybe when... Well, may, well, yeah, um... I would think... Yeah, I guess that when you're on a dragon, you want to be able to judge the distance of other objects in the air and on the ground. Um, but I think that, you know, when dragon riders are riding dragons, it's a bit of autopilot. Like, I think the dragon is making some of the decisions, and the dragon is sort of psychically interpreting the rider's intent and going along with it. Because, like, there's no way the dragon can hear the rider's voice shouting commands to them through the gusting winds... Um, so I think it's more of, like, it, it doesn't say so in the books, but I think it's meant to be more of, like, a psychic connection similar to skin changing, so... I, I don't think Amon's lack of an eye is going to slow Vagar down, <laughs> if that's what you mean. Uh, but, you know, but I mean, but, I mean symbolically, Amon has a blind spot, and that's something that they were playing with, with Viserys in the previous episode. Like, Viserys had a missing eye, and in the dinner scene, Alicent's family was on Viserys's blind side, his missing eye side, just like Viserys was blind to the corruption on that side of his family. So I wonder if Aemond might have a blind spot, metaphorically, in the future. Sam Soom says, Do you think Alicent will try to pursue the Iron Throne? There was that interesting line where Rhaenys whispered to Alicent, do you ever picture yourself on the Iron Throne? And that that is some real shit stirring from Rhaenys, my god. Um, will Alicent seize the throne for herself? I mean, it would be a little bit like when Cersei seized the throne for herself in the later seasons of Game of Thrones. Um, maybe she would claim, like, as Cersei did, oh, well, I mean, you know, Cersei's kids died, but, you know, maybe Alicent could seize the throne and say that, well, I am ruling on the behalf of my son Aegon 
Um, Aegon is young and, you know, he is um, uh, drunk currently, so I'm going to rule in his stead. Maybe Alicent will, you know, make herself Aegon's Hand of the King and will rule on his behalf. So, yeah, I think those are interesting questions. And it also ties into, like, the history of female rulers in this world. Like, you know, Rhaenys wanted to be a female ruler and didn't get to be. So maybe she would like to see Alicent as a female ruler, if not herself. Spirits says, someone stole the square rubies out of Aegon's crown. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. Um, Because Aegon's crown is meant to be studded studded with these big rubies, but there's sort of these square spaces on the crown that look like they should have rubies in them, but they don't. So yeah, maybe someone's stolen the rubies, because this is how the crown looks in the books. It clearly has these big square rubies, whereas the big square rubies are missing here. So did someone nick the rubies? I don't know. It's a weird choice. It's a weird choice. I don't know why they're missing. Scratty says, maybe Mazaria doesn't want to let Aegon kill off his bastards in the flea bottom fighting pits. Yeah, so I mean, Mazaria said, like, I want you to stop the fighting pits with the children because that's messed up. But I guess you're saying, Scratty, that maybe Mazaria also has like a political angle here where she wants to sort of get control of Aegon's bastards uh, so that they don't die in the Pokemon fights. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a possibility. Uh, Yes, Mitchell, Laris tried to burn the White Worm, and we don't know if he succeeded. Uh, Thank you, Fat Moose and Rulados, who says, It took a lot of willpower to not let my family, to not tell my family that I thought Alicent's feet looked nice. Rulados, you are very brave to watch this particular program with your family. James says, Was Rhaenys really historic, as they said inside the episode, killing, oh, really heroic, killing hundreds of civilians and then leaving. Yeah, I I agree that it's messed up that Rhaenys murdered all of those innocent people, and I think that that's consistent with the way it's always been in this world, where even the politicians who say that they're heroic uh, still think they're better than innocent people. And even the best kings use the lives of the people less powerful than themselves uh, to reinforce their own power so yeah i i think that's fucked up and i I, yeah i wish they sort of i don't know acknowledged it more like because you know it it might have been more that point might have been made better if we saw some of like the faces of the common people while they were getting trampled and killed by the dragon like if we got to see more of like the i mean i guess there's sort of a moment here but like to, to actually look at the face of the horror that Rhaenys is inflicting on these people, it seems like that should have happened, you know? Like, and even when she, like, burst out the gate, like, is she stomping on, like, a dozen people here, you know? Like, we should have seen the aftermath of that. So, yeah, I agree. Like, it's messed up that she did that. Because she didn't have to do that. I'm pretty sure there's a back door. Uh, Thanks for the super chat from Trash Panda and Justice, who says, Do you think the White Worm could now have a burned face... And later become Quaith. You guys are coming up with some great tinfoil today, and and I love it. Yeah, there is a very mysterious character in the books called Quaith, uh, who has a lot going on in the books, and some people think that she might be Alyssa Farman, and some people think that she might be Melisandre from the future, some people think that she's Daenerys from the future, some people think that she's Tyrion's time-traveling fetus. There's a lot of theories. Um, and yeah, I, I, it would be cool, like, I, it, it sounds bad to say, it would be cool if Mazaria was burned by Laris's fire, and maybe Mazaria's personality might change as a result of this fire. Uh, or maybe she's just dead, I suppose we'll find out. But yeah, cool, cool theories, cool theories. Lowell says, Alicent's friction with Otto was unexpected and excellent. She has agency now, like never before. I agree. Thanks, Victoria and Nelly. Nelly hopes that Aegon will make peace with the realm. Hell, maybe Aegon will suddenly become a good-hearted, well-intentioned king. Maybe he'll be the new Jaehaerys the Conciliator. Now that he actually wants to be king, maybe he'll actually do well in the position. Who knows? The, the way he's waving that sword around makes it look like he um, might want to use it, you know? Maybe he'll just be eager for conflict. 
Uh, did Rhaenys say that comment about Alicent wanting the throne to turn Alicent against her father? Yeah, it is really interesting, because on the one hand, Rhaenys was saying, hey, like, let's, let's be peaceful here. But she was also saying, hey, Alicent, maybe you should take the throne. And, you know, I, I guess what she means is that, you know, you could take the throne and be a benevolent ruler. But, I mean, realistically, Alicent trying to take the throne is likely to cause more conflict. I mean, she, I mean, as a Hightower, she's a Hightower woman. She couldn't seize the throne in her own name without pissing off everybody. So it, it does seem like a uh, pretty um, inflammatory thing to say, telling Alicent to take the throne. Uh, yeah, we did a poll. Baifong says, what a setup for the final episode. Um, Jess points out that dark-haired Targaryens have never actually ended up on the throne. Uh, what about Daeron Targaryen? I think Daeron did. Uh, Wealth Wolf says that Charles II of Spain's Habsburg's, Habsburg jaw was so bad that he couldn't chew properly. His father was his, was his mother's uncle, so it was a reverse John Danny. Uh, Ali Reza says, who is Alicent's mother? Yeah, we haven't seen Alicent's mother because she died some time ago, but it seems as though Otto Otto has been very sad ever since his wife died. And I think it's similar to, like, you know, Tywin's wife, Joanna, died, and I think Tywin became a lot more sort of hard and cruel and cold and empty inside after Joanna died, a little bit like, you know, Viserys after Emma died. Um, but yeah, we, we don't know much about Alicent's mother, but I think, you know, Alicent has struggled with not having a mother. Uh, what was the dragon that... Yeah, we're going to look at the preview shortly. Um, how do you rate this episode compared to the rest? Th this was a weird episode because they, they did a lot of unexpected things that aren't in the books. And also, like, you know, focusing it all around the greens was was an interesting choice that makes it a different episode to the others and we got some interesting sort of side character stuff with Eric and Arik and Alan Caswell and so yeah it was it was a very different episode i think i'm still figuring out if i like it but um i i, I think it gives us a lot to think about so we'll we'll process that for the explained video later in the week um <laughs> Thank you, Existential Shrew. Uh, thank you, Asenius, who says, I couldn't get behind the actor for Aegon until he had the crown on. Now I think it's a really good fit. Yeah, I, like, as I said, like, I think this season is basically backstory. And I think in a lot of ways, like, a lot of the character arcs in this season are all about showing us the character development that makes the characters into the person who is described in the books, you know? Like, a lot of these characters are a little bit different to how they appear in the books, but they change throughout the course of this season until they become the person that they are described as in the books, I think. And I think Aegon is maybe one of those. Um, and Daemon as well. Like, th there really is some growth with a lot of these characters. It's, it's subtle with a lot of them. You know, like, Daemon, I think, has become a bit more mature... Um, and a bit more smart and a bit more self-controlled in a way that only makes him more dangerous. Like, Daemon has more to lose now, and he's smarter, but he's still, like, absolutely willing to chop off a dude's head in the middle of a conversation, so, you know. Whereas Amond is, like, the new young Daemon. Like, Amond is... Oh, well, Amond is kind of smart, too. A little bit restrained compared to, like, Aegon, who's totally feckless. Anyway, um... In Fire and Blood, Gildane lies by saying that before Viserys died, he told his grandkids a story about how Jaehaerys flew over the wall to kill wildlings. But this is a lie, because dragons can't fly over the wall. Yeah, you're not wrong, Sudara-san, um, because Viserys in Fire and Blood, um, they describe his death, and it's different to the books, uh, because King Viserys uh, tells some stories to Helena's children, Jaehaerys, Jaehaerys, and Maegor, and he says that, ah, oh, my grandpa, King Jaehaerys, he was such a cool dude, and he fought wildlings beyond the wall, um, which, you know, is a made-up story anyway, so, you know, it, it, it's all fiction within fiction within fiction, um, but there is another thing earlier in Fire and Blood that describes that describes Queen Alysanne, the wife of Jaehaerys, visiting the wall, 
and trying to get Silverwing to fly over the wall, but Silverwing refused to fly over the wall. It seems as though Silverwing was, like, afraid of the magic of the White Walkers beyond the wall. Um, or maybe the magic of the wall itself. It has magical wards that prevented Silverwing from crossing it. It's this very sort of spooky, ominous moment. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that sort of remains a mystery, and it does indeed contradict Viserys' story. Maybe the maesters made it up. Uh, thank you, Roy, we answered that. Um, all your base, yeah, I mean, there's not a lot of magic in the books. A lot of talk about magic. It would make sense for there to be magic at this time because there are dragons and dragons are connected to magic. But there's not a lot of magic described in the books either. I am still holding out some hope for some kind of Old Gods Green Seer magic from Laris, potentially. But, you know, there are also some characters who have some magic later in the book. So, you know, that it might happen. It might happen. Uh, thank you, Charles, who says, They mentioned Yi T in this episode. Yeah, they mentioned that they don't know where Aegon is, and for all they know, he could be in Yi T. Um, Yi T is the Game of Thrones equivalent of China. It's like this far eastern location, um, and it's sort of mythical, like it's so far away in this medieval time that no one even really quite knows what it's like. Um, there's all these like legends of how huge and prosperous and amazing Yi T is at this time. Uh, Corlys went there, <laughs> actually. Corlys has been there, um, and that's part of why Corlys is so famous. So it would be cool to hear Corlys talk about some of these far distant places that he's been. Um, but yeah, it is it is also funny that they slip in a mention of E.T. in this show, given that there have been reports that there is a E.T. spin-off show in development from HBO. Uh, I think it's meant to be animated, and who knows if it'll actually, you know, end up being made. But um, just as they were talking about Nymeria's 10,000 ships in previous episodes, and they are apparently thinking about making a Nymeria show, they also are talking about E.T. similarly. E.T. phone home, indeed. <laughs> um, thanks for the super chat from Call Me Seeker, who says, This was a bit of a bottle episode. It might have been the cheapest episode of the season, since they didn't have to pay Paddy and Matt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, I imagine the show's only going to get more expensive from here, though. But yeah, I, and I think the idea is that next episode is going to be focused on Rhaenyra and Daemon as its own little bottle episode, yeah. Um, despite Rhaenys' mass murder, it was a yas moment. Could Team Black fly up and just burn everyone whenever they want? Well, I mean, remember the conversations that happened in Game of Thrones um, in the later seasons, uh, when some of Daenerys' advisors, or well, I mean Daenerys mostly, were saying like, hey, um, I'm just going to fly up and burn the Red Keep. I'm just going to go right, th right up there and take the throne and no one's going to stop me. Whereas people like Tyrion were saying, eh, maybe, maybe don't attack the city with dragons, because then lots of people might die. Um, I mean, as, you know, as we saw with Rhaenys and Melis, when you play with dragons, uh, there is collateral damage. Like, she wasn't trying to murder hundreds of peasants, but she did. <laughs> Just, just incidentally. Um, so, yeah, like Rhaenyra and Daemon, and, you know, w there will be conversations about this stuff later, but, like, that, you know, they might consider just attacking King's Landing, but there may also be concerns about collateral damage. Very well-grounded concerns about collateral damage. Carson says, Is the name Aegon cursed? Every time an Aegon is born, war follows. Yeah, I mean, Aenys' son, Aegon the Uncrowned, uh, did not do very well, and, uh, you know, Aegon IV, the Unworthy, was, uh, pretty cursed. Aegon V, Egg, was a lovely boy, but he also got, um, hard-boiled at Summer Hall, so, um, yeah, a lot, lot, I mean, look, I mean, a lot of Aegons die horribly, but a lot of kings die horribly, I mean, this is Game of Thrones, <laughs> a lot of everybody's die horribly. Thank you, this Justin, who says, My girlfriend and I have your videos on repeat in our house. Thank you for the reviews. Hi, Bree, I love you. Aw, well done, Justin. Thank you for the super chat. Brandon says, we, we, we talked about that. Bill says, Edward, we've got some historical 
parallels. Sorry, we've got to wrap this up. I've been talking for three hours. Um, that's a bit of a spoiler. Just like Day on the Drunken, often the nihilistic characters who's, who have given up on power are the only people free to speak the truth, even early Tyrion. I agree with you, Zerg. Like, a lot of the characters who are just, like, sad and uninvolved are sad and uninvolved because they see how futile and fucked up the system is. <laughs> and, you know, that, that, you know that, that's a feeling that people have in the real world. You know, you see how messed up the world is and you nope out. And maybe, yeah, in a way, Aegon is doing that. Aegon sees how fucked up the world is, so he's like, I don't want to participate, I'm just going to drink myself to death. Uh, which is not, you know, the way he does that is is not good. But uh, yeah, I agree. There's similar vibes with Daron the Drunken and Tyrion. Like Tyrion in, in the early episodes was just living a life of leisure because he didn't believe in this unjust world that had rejected him and spurned him. So he just lives a life of um, decadence. Aegon is the Chet Hanks of Targaryens. Uh, Abdel sa Abdiel says, this was my favorite episode. Everyone on Team Green is a different shade of green. Yeah, that's a great way to say it, Abdeel. The showrunners talk a lot about, like, shades of grey. Like, these are all very grey characters, but I suppose we can also talk about it as, you know, shades of green and black. Uh, we talked about that. Matt says... Rhaenys bursting through the floor felt very Game of Thrones Season 8. Yeah, I, I think that, you know... I, I sense that sometimes this show feels obliged to have a big action violent sequence that doesn't necessarily always make the story better. Like they feel the need for spectacle, even when it isn't necessarily, you know, they don't think through the consequences of it. But without spoiling anything, I, I think that Rainey's killing all those peasants may actually pay off in a way later on. So I, I think that this was not completely thoughtless, this particular set piece. Uh, Rational Orc says that Aegon is like Homelander. Nolandus says, I'm struck by how little the Starks seem to matter at this point. We see Lannisters and Baratheons, but no Starks. Well, keep in mind that, like, the North is really far away, um, and they're not very economically important, and there aren't all that many people living in the North. So, like, the Starks have historically, like, just not been very involved in uh, southern politics. I mean, in Game of Thrones, when Ned came south, it was, like, a big deal. Everyone's like, oh, Starks coming south. That doesn't happen every day. Uh, and, you know, historically, things go badly for the Starks when they come south. Like, you know, Rickard and Brandon. So, um, so yeah, this it, it, it is... This is the status quo. The Starks are usually not involved. I mean, the Starks are their own, you know, the Starks are the first men. The Starks are old gods worshippers. Like, the Starks are, are a very different culture. It's sort of a kingdom apart to the rest of the Seven Kingdoms. Uh, so, yeah, the Starks are doing what they always do, which is, you know, standing in the snow looking very solemn. Skinny says, When Alicent called Aegon an imbecile, I took it to be in a loving way, as if to say, you're my son. You're an idiot if you think I don't love you. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I disagree because in the previous episode, um, Aegon said to Aemon, Aegon, you're not my son. Like, Alicent almost dis disowned Aegon in the previous episode. I think that, you know, Alicent does feel some maternal love for all her children, but she also hates um, that her son is a rapist. Um, so <laughs> I think there's some complicated layered feelings there. But I, I, I think that when Alicent calls Aegon an imbecile, I, I think it is more of a rejection than anything positive there. Oh, I also thought it was really fucking sad when Alicent came and sat ne next to Helena and she tried to, like, comfort Helena, but then Helena, like, recoiled. Like, look at this. Like, Alicent tries to hug Helena, and Helena bats her hand as well, uh, away. So I think it's so tragic that, you know, insofar as Alicent tries to love her children, her children are not easy people to love. And, you know, Alicent doesn't have a mother herself, so I think she struggles with motherhood, lacking a mother herself, like her actor Olivia Cook has talked about that. So, yeah, really sad. Um, Eric says, why are some dragons named cool Valyrian stuff like Vagar and Meraxes and 
Beleriand, but some are named crap like Dreamfire. <laughs> well, you've got to remember that like these dragons bond with riders who are children. And of course children have silly names for dragons because they're children. Um, I, I think it's not surprising. I mean, it's like the... Um, it's like the Starks with with naming their direwolves, and like three year old Rickon names his direwolf Shaggy Dog, because he's a dog who's shaggy. It's silly, but it's so adorable. Um, so yeah, like of course some of the Targaryens give their dragons names that are not super badass. Dreamfire. I think Dreamfire is very appropriate for Helena because Helena has dragon dreams, so she names her dragon after dreams and fire. Seems very logical to me. Um, whereas, yeah, some of the other dragon names are, like, the names of Valyrian gods and, like, Valyrian language and stuff. So, um, yeah, it's cool. Um, thank you, Ghost. Thank you, Old School. I'm, I'm going to avoid repeating anything that I've already said. Thank you, Fabrice and Walker and Sebastian... Thank you, Cole. The Song of Ice and Fire isn't known. Nobody bringing up that Viserys may have meant Aegon the Conqueror. Yeah, look, I mean, the only person in the room when Viserys was dying was Alicent. And so Alicent is the only person who heard Viserys' wording about the prince that was promised and Aegon, and she thought he meant her son Aegon when he actually meant Aegon the Conqueror. Um... So no one else can say, oh, maybe he meant Aegon the Conqueror, because they don't know that that is how Viserys was talking. I mean, the other Greens don't care. <laughs> the other Greens don't care that Viserys, Viserys' dying wish was for Aegon to be king, because, Al because they were going to do it anyway. Like, Alicent is kind of the only person who cares that Viserys wanted Aegon to be on the throne. So it's not even super relevant to anyone except Alicent, you know? Um... And I think that that's, you know, that's just, that's how the misunderstanding happened. It is kind of silly, the misunderstanding being so consequential, but I guess such things happen in real life. Um, thank you, OP and Floats, who says, Why are people following orders from Alicent? She derived her power from being the queen, and she's no longer the queen. Yeah, I mean, sometimes the exact hierarchy of power is not super clear. And, like, with her ordering people around, I mean, she was ordering Kristen around. And Kristen's loyalty is to Alicent more than to anyone else. So, you know, sometimes what the exact, you know, command structure is meant to be on paper is not how it actually is in practice. Just like in the real world. Sometimes actual relationships matter more. So I'm not shocked that Kristen is listening to Alicent. And, you know, it's 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 like the sort of, you know, it, it was similar when Viserys was alive. Um, uh, thank you, Liam, who says that Viserys' stillborn son was actually Tyrion traveling through time to stop Daenerys. Jack says, was the building burned in Flea Bottom, an attack targeted at Mazaria? Yes, that was Laris trying to kill Mazaria with his fireflies. Keegan says that Alicent's shenanigans are going to cause my wife to throw a shoe through my TV eventually. Benjamin says Mushroom would be so funny in the show. We, we did get to see Mushroom briefly at Rainier's wedding. Uh, according to the behind the scenes stuff, this fella is Mushroom. But yeah, he does have a bigger role in um, the books. Mushroom is the court jester and he entertains Viserys and others in the family. And uh, it's Mushroom who claims that Alicent poisoned Viserys, although Mushroom wasn't in King's Landing at the time. He was on Dragonstone. So Mushroom is full of shit. He, he does make stuff up, but he also is correct some of the time. So that's a whole thing. Thank you, Luke and Emily. Um, and I think we've got to wrap up this live stream because I've been talking for three hours. Um, I apologize for any super chats that I missed. Um... It's, it, it's been three hours. Thank you for your support, though, and thank you for watching. We're going to have a very brief look at the On The Next Episode preview trailer. So let's do that. So if you don't want to see the On The Next Episode preview trailer, uh, you may wish to avert your gaze. So uh, we see Melis. We see Rhaenys on Melis, I think it is, 
flying to Dragonstone to say, hey, Rhaenyra, the Greens are taking the throne and Otto wants to kill you. Um, I wonder if Rhaenys is also going to tell Rhaenyra that, like, hey, by the way, like, Alicent doesn't want to kill you. Alicent is trying to be more, like, peaceful. So maybe, like, oppose Otto but don't oppose Alicent. That seems like an important detail that I hope... (laughs) I hope Rhaenys relays to to Rhaenyra. And again, I, I'm really enjoying Rhaenys' armor. I, I'm, I love to see some dragon riders in armor. Good times. Um, yeah, and Rhaenys is telling Rhaenyra that, that, that Otto wants to kill her children. Um, so this is very real and threatening and very scary to Rhaenyra. We see uh, Dark Sister, the Valyrian steel sword of Daemon, is, what is Doc? Is Doc's sister just leaning against a table, or is it like in a corpse right now? No, nah, it's it's sheathed. Whenever Daemon's around, you got to worry if he's killing someone. Um, Daemon is saying, "Don't submit to the High Towers," because you know Alicent was talking about offering a peace offer to Rhaenyra, so maybe Rhaenyra is considering peace. Peace, peace might save some lives. Uh, but she's worried about her kids, and she would like the throne. And, you know, Rhaenyra has a sacred responsibility of the prophecy handed down by Viserys. And, you know, the alternative to Rhaenyra is Aegon, who is terrible. So there's a lot of big issues to grapple with here. Um, Aemond is taking off his eye patch. We're going to get to see what's under Aemond's eye patch. What does he keep in there? Is it a sapphire? Is it an emerald? Is it some snacks? Can't wait to find out. Uh, we see the painted table. It looks like Rhaenyra has summoned some friends and allies. We see Jace and Luke, and is that that's a Kingsguard? That's a Kingsguard. Um, there are a couple of Kingsguard members who we haven't met yet, and we also know that Eric seems to be heading Rhaenyra's way, and Harold. We don't know where Harold is, so the Kingsguard could be important because the Kingsguard, as well as being good warriors are also symbols of political legitimacy. And it is a problem for Rhaenyra that Aegon has Aegon's sword, Aegon's crown, Aegon's dagger. He's, he's, he has King's Landing. Like, Aegon has a lot of symbols that make him look like the legitimate king. So having some King's Guard uh, is important. Um, the painted table is looking very fancy. Have they, like, r- poured some molten gold into the indentations in the map? Have they painted the gold in there? Is that wax? Is that... I don't know. That looks very cool on the painted table. But yeah, again, this is like the table made by Aegon the Conqueror before his conquest. Yeah, it looks like they've like poured some like stuff into the table. That looks super cool. I like it. Um, So yeah, yeah, every man standing around the painted table is urging her for war. So there's there's definitely like a gender thing that they're playing with that all these bloody ambitious men are trying to start wars while the women are trying to protect their families. Um, Lay siege to the Red Keep, says this fella. And there's Maester Gerardus. So yeah, I think some people are going to say like YOLO in there with the dragons right now. People preparing for war. And what will Rhaenyra do? Send us, say the children. So so these guys are dragon riders. Bela is a dragon rider with Moondancer. Jace is a dragon rider with Vermax. Luke is a dragon rider with Arax. Raina does not have a dragon. She's the odd one out. So I wonder how Raina can contribute. But the kids are eager to join in. Like, you know, just like at dinner, the kids are the most eager for violence. You know, getting into fisticuffs with Amond and Aegon. So I wonder how they will be involved. Uh, We've got someone running up to a dragon. It looks like Luke or Jace running on to mount their dragon. I hope that goes well for them. There's Vega at a castle. What castle is that? I I don't want to spoil it. We're going to talk all about it next week. But that's Vega, and it looks like there is a very exciting confrontation going on there. And we see that Eric Cargill has brought Viserys and Jaehaerys' crown to Rhaenyra. So that's another useful symbol of legitimacy. And maybe this is the crown that Rhaenyra might wear while Aegon wears the crown of Aegon the Conqueror. Um, so we've got Jace riding Arax, it looks like, or Luke riding, yeah, Luke riding Arax through a storm. I hope that ends well for him. Um, a power that has not been seen. Your cause holds a power that has not been seen since the days of old Valyria. Um, are they talking about... What are they talking about? A power that has not been seen 
since the days of old Valyria. Are they talking about, like, blood magic? Are they talking about Vega? Are they talking about prophecy? What do you guys think that means in the chat? A power that has not been seen since the days of old Valyria. And who's saying it? Curious, curious. Uh, and then we get a dragon's eye with someone reaching towards the dragon reflected in the eye. Daemon is singing in High Valyrian. Maybe he's um, courting some dragons, trying to get a dragon's loyalty. Which dragon is that? Could that be the cannibal? Ooh. Because there are, there are some wild dragons on Dragonstone, so I wonder if Daemon is trying to recruit some more dragons for their cause. Maybe Reyna is finally going to get a dragon. Yeah, my god, that is a big dragon. I, I hope that's the cannibal. The cannibal is like this wild, scary dragon that lives on Dragonstone that may play a role in the story. Uh, oh my god, we got Otto delivering some peace terms. That's cool. It echoes the um, confrontation in, like, episode two. So, hey, maybe there's hope for peace, guys. A summit on Dragonstone will solve everything, and that looks like Vega. All right, um, that was the preview. Vermithor. Yeah, yeah, maybe it's Vermithor or Silverwing. Yeah, Vermithor might be more likely than Cannibal. You guys are probably right. A dragon horn. Ooh, that's an interesting idea, Krizzle. Yeah, maybe the power that has not been seen since old Valyria is a dragon horn. Because the dragon horn... Uh, Valyria apparently had dragon horns that could control dragons. Because uh, the Valyrians were more... Um, more advanced in their control over the dragons. All right. Um, have a quick look at a couple more super chats. Uh, do you think Mazaria will take on Laris in the shadows? Yeah, I think that Mazaria will be cross with Laris for trying to burn her to death, and it would be really cool to see like a spy master versus spy master you know, struggle in the shadows, just like Littlefinger and Varys were on their own level, you know, doing their own fight in Game of Thrones. When the doors were being shut were those Lannisters. Uh, yeah, there were some, like, guards in red outfits. I think they were just, like, Targaryen guards. I don't think they were Lannisters. Do you prefer Hot D or Got Season 1? Oh, it's, it's so different. I mean, I, Hot D definitely benefits from, like, a bigger budget more lavish production, and I think they've used that well. Um, I think both Hot D and Game of Thrones are good, like, adaptations of the source material. Like, they both stay mostly faithful, but they make some pretty smart changes. Um, Aegon's throne looks Persian-inspired. Yeah, I, I don't think that was his, like, throne per se. Like, I think his throne is the Iron Throne. But yeah, that, that seat looked interesting. They talked about, like, a Byzantine influence for some of the design, some of the outfits and stuff. Um, Kristen, all women are Queen's Cole. Yeah, well, Kristen's not a big fan of Queen Rhaenyra, however. Um, yeah, okay, we've got to end this. Thank you so much for watching, um, and we'll see you next time. We're going to make an explained video uh, to explore this episode in a scripted, proper, edited video. You can listen to these live streams in a podcast feed, if you would like. There is a link in the description to the Alt Shift X podcast. Uh, you can also listen to Alt Shift X videos as an audio podcast feed. And so you can also check that out in the description. Uh, you can support on Patreon if you would like. You can buy merchandise if you would like. You can buy an Alt Shift X t-shirt. You can buy an Alt Shift X pin. You can buy an Alt Shift X pin and put it in an Alt Shift X t-shirt. Think of the possibilities. Um, and please like and subscribe. And um, if you're looking for other House of the Dragon content in the meantime, there are lots of other great content creators that you might like to check out, like Joe Magician, History of Westeros, Radio Westeros, The Ring of Us podcast, the... Tony Teflon, David Lightbringer, Glidus, Present Jacobs. There are lots of wonderful creators that you can go and check out. Uh, it's a wonderful community. There's lots of good people making good stuff. And so you should go support them as well. 
Okay. Uh, wrapping it up. Thank you. Thank you for the moderation from Schubert. You can go and check out Schubert's channel if you would like to do that. Uh, and it is essential that you do not check out uh, Alt Swift X. Alt Swift X is a despicable YouTube channel that has been uh, ripping off Alt Shift X for a long time, really just just making a mockery of Alt Shift X's style. Some people say that Alt Shift X sounds like Alt Shift X. I don't know what they're talking about. Um, and Alt Shift X is getting close to 100,000 subscribers, and I'm a bit worried that if Alt Shift X hits, well, a million, no, 100,000. <laughs> I'm a bit worried that if Alt Shift X hits 100,000 subscribers, um, it might encourage Alt Shift X to make more videos, and that, that would be a disaster for us all. Alright, thanks guys. Uh, be well. See you in the next one. Cheers.